Okay. All right, welcome everyone. I am Randy Speck. I'm chair of ANC 34G and I represent the single member district that is 3G, 34G03. And it's the area between Nebraska and Utah and Broad Branch, broadly speaking. Uh, welcome to our meeting tonight. This is our regular uh, meeting on the second and fourth Mondays of each month. Uh, we're glad to have everyone here and we hope others will join us as we proceed through the meeting. Uh, the first thing we'll do is introduce all the commissioners and uh, everyone is here tonight. So Connie, you want to begin? Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Connie Chang. I am the commissioner for 34G05 and that starts at uh, Legation and it goes up Connecticut on the east side and it swings over uh, Western, comes down Broad Branch Road and then there's a little stem that's um, Nevada, Chevy Chase Parkway down to um, Kanawha, like in, in that area of Jessalyn, Kanawha. Nice to be here. Michael? I'm Michael Zeldin. I represent um, 3G04, which is pretty much Morrison to Tennyson, Western to Utah, and it includes the Lafayette Elementary School. And Peter? Jocelyn, I represent District 6, which is Connecticut, the west side of Connecticut back to 41st. The Western Avenue border with Maryland to the Chevy Chase Circle down Connecticut, the military, and Peninsula to the east of Connecticut, basically Kanawha, uh, Legation. And uh, hey, John. Uh, I'm John Higgins. I'm at ANC 34G02, which is near uh, Rock Creek Park between Oregon and Utah on the east and west and between Nebraska and uh, Wise Road on the south to north. Chris? I'm Chris Frambaluti. I represent 3G07, which is roughly bounded by military, Nebraska, Nevada, and um, what was the other one? Oh, Reno, with a few minor exceptions, little excurred, uh, inclusions in uh, Peter and uh, Connie's districts. And Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. My name is Lisa Gore. I'm the commissioner for 34G01. I cover Hawthorne and portions of Barnaby Wood. So basically Western Avenue to Oregon, to Upland, around the Pinehurst Circle area, then back over to Beach. Okay, we have uh, all seven commissioners here tonight, uh, which is a quorum. And so we can conduct business. Uh, this is really pretty remarkable. We've not had a single commissioner miss a single meeting uh, all year. So that's, that's really quite good. Um, let me just, first of all, before we uh, go to the agenda for the night, let's, uh, let me just give you a brief overview of the procedures for the night. Uh, again, we're meeting virtually as we have for the last year. Uh, all of the commissioners will have audio and visual video. Uh, the attendees, will not have the audio and video unless uh, Lisa makes them a participant, which I've got to make Lisa the co-host so she can do that. And uh, then she, she can make you a panelist so that you will be able to then have audio and vi video as well. Uh, we will uh, go through the, the agenda items and if we get to one that has uh, a, a number of people who will want to speak about on that, which I suspect we will tonight. Uh, we'll probably take account of how many people want to speak. And if there are quite a few, uh, we may have to limit the time for each person to, uh, to speak, probably to three minutes so that we can get to everyone. Um, if you have questions or comments during the meeting, you can use the Q&A function to ask questions or uh, we prefer if you put comments in the chat section, uh, which you can do uh, as well. But it would just e be easier for us to keep track of them during the meeting if you just have questions in the Q&A and chat uh, for the comments. Um, we are recording the meeting tonight, and uh, it will be available on our YouTube channel uh, tomorrow uh, for all of those who can't make it. Okay, uh, the first thing we need to do is adopt our agenda for the night. Um, the agenda has been posted on our website and on various um, listservs and other social media in the community. 
Uh, are there any modifications or changes anyone wants to make to the agenda? John? Yes, I was able to get to everybody except Michael today. I have a suggestion that when it comes to the DDOT item on the agenda, that we uh, postpone the part dealing with commission consideration and vote, and but continue with the public comment period uh, during that time. It's a very complex issue. I think the commission probably needs a little bit more time to, to discuss this. Obviously, we can bring in the opinions and comments that we are, we'll, we'll be hearing tonight into that discussion. So the time that we would have for our discussion maybe could be uh, allocated to the uh, to people who would like to comment tonight. This re an agenda change requires a unanimous uh, consent by by all the commissioners. So I hope everybody is on board with that, and I would like to propose that. Anyone have any discussion? Lisa? I don't consent to it. We have um, received some information from DDOT that we probably need to meet, move forward. There's uh, time sensitive when it comes to our vote on this matter. I spoke with DDOT as well as Michael Weldon spoke with DDOT probably within the last hour. And they are, they're under the impression that they're gonna get a resolution um, by May 1st. So, I am not for putting off the vote today. Okay. Well, uh, all those, we'll just go with the agenda that's already been published then, if we don't have unanimous consent. Um, all those in favor of adopting the agenda? As is, right? As is. 7-0, mm -hmm. okay. All right, uh, let's move to announcements. And I do have several uh, tonight. Uh, the first is uh, with regard to COVID vaccinations. And I just want to emphasize the importance of this to everyone by just providing a few uh, statistics. Um, as of today, about 490,000 doses have been administered by the district and about 363,000 of those have been to DC residents. Uh, only about 20% of DC residents are fully vaccinated and about 13.4% have had partial vaccinations. These numbers seem really particularly low. And in our neighborhood, um, the, the, the numbers are higher. Uh, in uh, Chevy Chase, it's uh, about 27%. And in Barnaby Woods, it's 78%, uh, no, excuse me, it's 35%. So they're a little bit, we're doing a little bit better than the city as a whole, but we're still not where we ought to be. Uh, at this stage, and especially now that everyone is, a, is um, eligible for a vaccination. Uh, there are a couple of programs that the mayor has instituted uh, to try to speed the vaccinations up. One is residents who are unable to leave their home can now call a number to register um, and get the vaccination at home, uh, which will help a lot of people I know. Additionally, those who are over 65 and have not been vaccinated can go without an appointment to one of the walk-up sites across the city. And there will be 30 walk-in appointments available every day. Uh, and the closest site for our residents would be the Lamont Rec Recreation Center. And that would be from on Wednesday through Saturday from nine until 1 p.m. You can get that walk-in walk uh, vaccination. Finally, there is a program beginning uh, May 1st to go door to door to help people register for vaccinations. It's called a day of action and where you can pick up materials and instructions and at various locations across the district. The nearest locations for us are Friendship Recreation Center at 4500 Van Ness Street and the Fort Stevens Recreation Center at 3727 Van Buren Street. And there's more information on the uh, DC website for coronavirus. So, I mean, these are really very important things that I think we need to pay attention to. We're not out of the woods yet, so we need to, to continue to be vigilant. Uh, the next announcement is about a program by the historic Chevy Chase DC. Um, on April 28th at 7.30, they will be hosting the first of three Zoom programs to help provide historical perspective and context on the small area planning process that will be shaping our community's future. 
This first program will be reimagining Washington circa 1900 and will feature author historian Tom Lewis discussing the Macmillan process that essentially shaped the DC of today. There will be two other programs uh, by uh, historic Chevy Chase DC in May and in June. Then there will also be a webinar uh, tomorrow night by Ward 3 Vision, which will present the building, building inclusivity in Ward 3. What's the affordable housing, what's in the afford, affordable housing toolbox? And there will be several speakers, including Mary Che, uh, Tracy Lowe, who's a, at the Brookings Institution, uh, Office of Planning Director Andrew Trueblood, and David Crystal, who's a retired Arlington County uh, housing director. And finally, uh, there will be a CCCA, the Chevy Chase Citizens Association webinar um, on April 29th from 7 until 8.15 on practical tips for Earth Month. And the speakers will include Ted Trebu, who's one of my constituents, uh, who's the director of DC Sustainable Energy Utility, uh, Ariel Conti, who is manager of the River Smart um, Homes Program, uh, Alma Patty, who is a science coordinator for Merch Elementary School, where she oversees the Merch uh, Green Scene, and Shelly Cohen, a renewable energy and energy efficiency expert who will talk about environmental and financial benefits of going solar in DC. And there's more information about this program at the Chevy Chase DC, Chevy Chase Citizens Association website. Okay, any other commissioners have announcements? No announcements. Any community announcements? Um, there's one um, from Council Member Che's office. D. Okay, D. You want to let uh -huh. D make, make her a panelist? Hello, Dean. Can you hear us? Good evening, everyone. I can hear you. Can you hear me fine? Oh, great to see you, Dean. We haven't seen you in ages. I've been listening to you guys. I just don't always pop on the video, but I do want to thank you for the awesome meetings and every, everything. So I've been here and just thank you for keeping the community going uh, during the pandemic and everything. Um, so I just want to let you guys know um, the council member is planning uh, through her committee, the Committee on Transportation and the Environment, to hold a public roundtable to hear from residents and our commissioners about the surge in traffic fatalities that we've experienced in the district. Um, also, with that public roundtable, she will uh, be urging for full funding of the Vision Zero um, Enforcement Omnibus, Omnibus Amendment. So uh, we do not have a date yet. Our office is working with DDOT. We hope to have a date in the very near future as soon as I have that date, I will share with you and ask that you please, please, please share with your networks. Um, we want to hear from everyone. So sign up. Don't forget that the meeting will be virtual, even if you cannot uh, submit your testimony and attend in real time, so to speak. Please don't hesitate to, to send us written testimony. We still want to get you, you know, get an understanding of what you feel, what you see, what's going on with traffic and safety concerns. So again, as soon as I have a date for that, I'll circle back and make sure you have that. And thank you all. And don't forget if you have any issues, problems, questions, concerns, I am your main point of contact, but you know you can reach out to anyone in the office, but I do attend your meetings and, and pay close attention to what happens in Chevy Chase. Dee, can, can you just, Dee, can you just say a, a, a word or two about the May 3rd round table for the uh, lead service line removal programs. I know that the, the scope of that has been changed recently and it's not going to be a full look at all of the lead service line issues, but really just the, the programs for, um, for supporting people who want to replace their lead service lines. Well, yeah, pretty much um, you captured it in a nutshell what the hearing will be about. But again, we do want to urge residents to Pay attention and understand that we are pushing and working to have um, funding made available to, to have those lead service lines um, pay for 
not by residents, hopefully, but you know, through some other funding, we did get a lump sum of federal money in. And so we're waiting to see how all of that works out mm -hmm. with the budget. So again, that's something we're paying attention to. I know you guys have all, you know, have been supportive of it, are paying attention. Um, mm -hmm. And so we just, again, urge you to, to participate in that May 3rd uh, hearing. And, and then there will be another hearing, a round table in June. Yes, I, yeah. yes, 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 I'm sorry. Yes, right. there'll be two separate right. hearings. Um, and then also you may already have the budget, the revised budget hearing schedule, but I did send that to your email, Randy. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank Question you. John? Yes. John, you got a question? Uh, yes, uh, I'm glad to hear you have the, the, the federal um, funding for that. I'm wondering if that federal funding is related to any of the residents uh, infrastructure programs, because I understand that in, in one of them, there is a very significant uh, amount of that dedicated strictly to uh, lead pipes and lead, lead service lines. So I don't know if you're aware of that, or if the funding came from that, or if that would be in, a, in addition to what we already have. Do you have any information on that? I don't, but I can definitely get clarification for oh. you. My understanding is that there, there's some money in the uh, Recovery Act that can be used for uh, lead service line removal, but that if the infrastructure bill passes, that's by no means a certainty, and if it includes uh, the money for lead service line replacement, that would be a, a further source of funding. Uh, I had a, a meeting with DC Water just this last week and uh, the $350 million that they requested, if I understood them correctly, is really only for the next two years. Uh, it does not cover the full amount that would be necessary to move all lead service lines. Uh, we're still working with DC Water on that, and I'm hoping to have a meeting with them later this week to get more details on their estimate for what the costs are. So it is, it's a, a process that continues. Okay, anything else from commissioners? All right, Dee, thank you very much. Thank you guys, have a good one. I'll definitely be on to hear the rest of the agenda. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I saw- Alex, yep. Alex Previtt, so I'm gonna permit you now. And also Matthew, so I'm gonna do Alex first and then Matt. Good evening. Thank you all for your time. Um, this is Alex Kreffich from the Chevy Chase Main Street. Um, just two announcements I wanted to share. One that Randy had already touched on was um, the updates to the COVID-19 and the mayor's rollout of uh, information and vaccinations. In addition to the vaccination information, I wanted to let folks know that at today's meeting, the mayor announced a number of expansions for businesses um, and other spaces within the district. I'll post a link in a chat with a news article that covers all of these, but they range from increasing indoor capacity at non-essential retail business, increasing the number of people that can be seated together at a table, uh, increases to the amount of people that can participate in special events indoors and outdoors within the district, gyms, public pools, and places of worship. Um, again, I'll put some more of the information for that in the chat, but uh, for what that will look like is these changes go into effect Saturday 1st. Um, and I can say that from my perspective on the main street is I'm still interested in working with all of our business owners to make sure that we're using the, uh, the, the best available science we have to make sure that all folks who are making use of business facilities within the Chevy Chase main street are doing so in the safest way possible. So um, you may see some changes to that. And again, I encourage folks to look and get an understanding of the mayor's uh, role and I'll post that in the chat as well. Um, the other update I wanted to provide quickly was just regarding the um, American City Diner location. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, there had been a discussion regarding some graffiti that had uh, been put up on the uh, billboard uh, at the site. Um, since then, I've been able to confirm by speaking with the realtor who's responsible for the space, KLNB. Um, I know now that they have put in with the city's Department of Public Works uh, to go through their process of graffiti removal. 
Um, at various times during the last year, my understanding has been that program was paused or suspended. Um, I'm following up with DPW to find out a little bit more about what their timeline would look like for a project like that. And I will provide an update to this group as soon as I receive it. Great, thank you, Alex. Peter? You're, we can't hear you, Peter. You, you can hear me? We can barely hear you. Barely. Okay. You know, you're muted now. I think just speak up. Unmute yourself and then speak up. You're muted. You're muted. I also had the sound turned down. So oh, there okay. you go. All right. <laughs> a quick question for Alex, which is that uh, when they remove the graffiti, do they destroy the billboard? That's been the ultimate question I've had. Um, my goal is to maintain that billboard as much as possible. Um, the, my understanding of DPW's graffiti process is they would most likely just paint over it in white paint. Um, mm. I think many people would want to see a different solution reached for there. Um, I know also that the property owner is balancing the need of maintaining that property. Um, my hope is to work with the city and with the property owner to identify something that, even if it's a short-term solution, such as placing a covering over it, um, is one that the, the actual painting itself can be restored in a way um, to what it was in the past. Uh, the city's pieces might not be the best way for that, and I'm hoping when the city is able to present to the property managers what their options are, that I can explore with them what the options are that best prevent that best protect their investment in the property as well as the community's feelings about the the mural itself. Okay, and let me just say to the my fellow commissioners and to Alex that we're, we're going to have to weigh in on that. That that's becoming more and more of a not just an eyesore, but a, a public health hazard, there's broken glass. There's, there's, so the, the, mm -hmm. the, whoever's managing the property it better be on their toes about, uh, we've got to, we're gonna have to do something about that. It's a mess. Thank you. Al Alex, do you have any idea whether um, the Steve Solis lease is now terminated or whether they still have any interest in the property at all? They were gonna redevelop it? My understanding and this is my understanding and not the, the hard information on it is that that project has ended and they are now looking to lease the space to a wider group of people. My understanding is also that the previous project resulted in um, the removal of a lot of the, essentially gutting the building and removal of a lot of the materials within it. So as they've been trying to approach new potential people to occupy the space, the cost associated with repairing that and making the, the property actually provide what it needs to um, has been a, a subject for them. I'm also speaking with them about various grants and other opportunities that uh, foundations or other institutions have, particularly for properties that are, um, if not historically registered, located, sort of considered a community fixture. Um, and mm -hmm. I am also interested in connecting them with partners to actually fill that space. When I did speak with them, I did mention the um, garbage accumulation that some others mm -hmm. have noted. Um, their comment at that time had been that they would send someone to the property to get a better understanding of what was happening. Thanks, thanks for your work on that, Alex. Much appreciated. Michael? Just one last question. Do I understand correctly that there are um, oil drums from its um, historic past as, as a gasoline station? Is there been an environmental impact on that property? I'm unaware if there are gas drums currently on it. I know there is awareness and there has been environmental impact studies about its previous usage. Um, I do not know the last date that those were uh, done. I would assume the most recent it would have been done would have probably been in the last two to three years um, and that conditions may have changed at that time. So getting a better understanding of the environmental impact is something I'm also interested in working with uh, yeah. Cal and beyond. Yeah. But just to, just to clarify, my understanding is that these aren't drums this was a gas station and there are tanks underground. So it's a, besides the building now being gutted, besides being empty for all these years, we have, we have a super fun site in the middle of it. Oh. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's gonna be a real challenge to figure out what to do with that property. Honey? But Alex, last time you said the billboard is um, designated as historical, correct? What, what is the exact des designation for the public to know? 
My understanding is that the DC, the historic registry has that billboard associated with it, but not the- That mural. Itself. The yeah. mural itself, right? The mural is. However, my understanding is that most of the things, most of the processes by which historical properties are sort of understood and how different policies go through with them are by address. So it's a unique situation where the address itself doesn't have the designation, but there is a note about the billboard itself. Um, I am looking to try and gain as collect as many resources about that as I can, as I have that conversation with the Department of Public Works as it goes through their system for graffiti removal. And again, to encourage a solution where the work itself can be preserved. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thank, thank you, Alex. Okay, you wanna let Matt um, make an announcement now too? Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. That's great. Um, happy Monday, folks. Uh, nice to be with you uh, virtually. I have a couple updates I wanted to share from Ward 4, um, and then I'll drop some contact info in the chat in case anybody in the room wants to be in touch. Um, Commissioner Speck, you said most of, of everything about the vaccines and COVID that I wanted to say. I'll just reiterate that if you want to come over to Lamont Recreation Center on Kansas and Tuckerman, and Northeast DC, uh, they'll have walk up um, of a walk up time from Wednesday through Saturday uh, from 9 a.m. until 1 p.m. Um, and you'll notice this little Dallas is in the background, making sure his voice is heard too. Um, a few other things, uh, one regarding public safety. And we had a conversation uh, last week on April 20th with uh, some of the city's leadership around public safety. Uh, we met with uh, MPD, uh, uh, Patrol Chief Green came through, uh, Deputy Mayor of Public Safety and Justice Chris Geldart came through, um, Director of Gun Violence Prevention Linda Harley Harper came through, and we had a conversation about public safety, and so we hope you'll uh, take a look at the video of that, it's kind of long, two, two plus hours, so if you can watch snippets of it, um, I think it would be helpful to get a sense of what these folks are thinking about in regard to bringing public safety initiatives um, that start to address the root problems of violence. Uh, to uh, blocks all over the, the district. We're basically advocating from the Ward 4 lens that, that uh, some of those building blocks are, are focused here in Ward 4. And we could sure use help um, advocating for that. And so I'll drop in the chat a link uh, to that program where you can email to advocate for neighborhoods or, or blocks in your neighborhood where you think there need to be increased safety measures. Um, and then uh, second and lastly, regarding some legislative updates, uh, just wanted to let you know what we're up to on the legislative end. Last week, we introduced the Law Enforcement Vehicular Pursuit Reform Act, uh, basically to, to protect the safety of residents uh, by kind of adding teeth to the current policies, restricting police car chases in the district. Um, and then there's another, uh, the White Supremacy and Policing Prevention Act, uh, both of which will come before council for a hearing on May 20th. We hope if you're interested in, in either of those pieces of legislation, uh, reach out to me. I'll connect you with our policy and ledge team. We're happy to hear your feedback uh, about either of them uh, or to answer questions that you might have. Um, and then obviously we'll take the, uh, the council will take its first vote on the comprehensive plan next week. And so um, your commission's done a, a great job in, in engaging the council on this. And we hope that all the residents will do the same. And the last thing I'll say is just connect with us in all the ways uh, that you can. I'll put a link in the chat for our newsletter, which we send out weekly that we hope provides robust information about what's going on in Ward 4 and with our work. Uh, we'll also launch our website finally uh, sometime this week. We're hoping that tomorrow uh, we can launch it. So please be on the lookout for that. It's beautiful. I've seen some mock-ups and I, I hope you'll uh, find it useful. And the last thing is that the council member wants to start hosting community office hours uh, in the safest way we can figure out how to do it, whether it be virtual or socially distanced walks or someplace out, out and about in the community. Uh, so by your next meeting, I'm hoping to have some more solid details about what that will look like. Um, and that's it for me. I'll just close by saying my name is Matthew Landrew. I work in constituent services for the Ward 4 council member. I'm happy to be a resource to you however you need. Thanks for your time. Uh, Matthew, let me just reiterate uh, the uh, resolution that we passed at our last meeting uh, about the changes to the uh, comprehensive plan that were proposed and then taken back and re redone. Uh, we're very interested in that language in the comprehensive plan 
uh, as it relates to small area plans and their primacy and how that needs, the small area plans need to be completed before there is a zoning change. And I hope Dee's listening to this as well for council member Che, but it's very important for our commission that those changes that we propose be made and that we not retreat back from that as uh, was in the, the uh, April 20th um, changes at, that were discussed at the council. So just want to reiter reiterate that to you and you can pass it on to the council member. I certainly will, thank you. Okay. Matt, before you get off and um, <clears throat> also for Dee um, to take back to council member Che, so Matt, you know, at the um, meeting, one of the questions that I asked Chief Green regard was regarding the non-traffic stop statistics for Black residents in the second district. And I am going to briefly share my screen um, to see if I could let everyone see the statistic. And I just want to make sure too, I get it right. Uh, actually, I don't have, I had to get something from Michael and I moved it off the uh, screen. <laughs> Let me get it back real quick. Lisa, do you also want to bring, um, bring Dee back up as a panelist in case um, she has something yeah. to say? She's, um, she's listening yeah. though. But. Yeah, she's listening. I mean, I, th this is, um, let's see, hang on. So this is um, <clears throat> from the DC Police Reform Commission. One of the things that I asked Chief Green at the forum that um, Council Member Lewis George held was about the statistic. So as you can see, one of the things that they noted, this was a 17th month period from July 22nd, 2019 through December 31st. Um, the amount and percentage of traffic stops in the district. And what they did, which I found was so very interesting, was they did it by police district and by population. So for second district, the percentage of stops of black residents was 64.5, but we only comprise 7.5% of the population. Um, and the reason why they did non-vehicle uh, stops is because you're um, more likely to have a disparity there. So if you're having a vehicle stop, you know, you could say that you didn't know the race of the individual being stopped, but when you're having a non-traffic stop, mm -hmm. non-vehicle stop, you know, pretty much that's a face-to-face -face counter. So race and gender, um, orientation might be more likely to come into play. And what these statistics show, that's an ex that is an extreme disparity. So for 65% or so of the population that's being stopped only comprises 7% of your population. There are a lot of questions that I have about those stop statistics. Um, I didn't really get an answer <laughs> at the forum, but um, Matt, to let you know, and you can let the council member know, Chief Green did call me back and we had a conversation about that. Um, and I am hoping that between council member Che's office and council member Lewis George's office, both have residents within the second district that we can um, get together at some point and really you know, nail this down with MPD to see what's behind those statistics. This is takeover to our standing committee on um, racial equity and have them look at it. But I think in the interim, we could probably get together and decide that, um, you know, some kind of strategy for getting MPD back to the table. Now, second district was the most disparate, but there are also disparities through all majority white districts in the district. So uh, first district, third district, and second district, second district being the worst. So um, hopefully we can get together. And Bo, I see you're, th you're definitely, definitely would love to work with the other commissioners within second district on this. Thanks, Dee. Hey, thanks, Lisa. 
Okay, any, anything, any other community announcements? I don't see anyone's hand up or... <laughs> Thanks, Matt. <laughs> okay. All right, we'll then move into the substantive part of the, the meeting tonight. And the first thing we're gonna discuss is a topic that's been on our agenda for many of our meetings, and that is the small area plan process. Uh, we'll first have a report from Peter and Connie who are on the uh, community advisory committee for the small area plan. And then I think there are a couple of motions that we're going to consider. Uh, Peter or Connie, whichever one wants to begin. Well, Peter, let me, you can go ahead. Well, let me just offer a sort of mini agenda for this section of the meeting. I think that we, uh, Connie and I, should give a report, a very short report, given that there haven't been any more community advisory committee meetings since our last meeting. Um, uh, and then uh, we take up uh, the transmittal of the uh, petition to, um, to uh, the council and, and district uh, aid offices. Uh, and then uh, uh, the, um, I'd like to offer my community forum resolution. And then um, it would help, I think, if we had a discussion about uh, the council's, what Randy has already mentioned, which is the council's reaction to our April uh, 12th um, resolution um, seeking to protect the integrity of our uh, small area plan and whether further steps may be needed uh, either now or in the future. So that's the, the, the mini agenda I would propose. Does that seem acceptable, Connie? Yeah, I think so. Would you, you wanna start with a, I mean, I don't, I, there hasn't been a lot of development on, at least that I know of on the, on the small area plan. Right, we do not have, um, I don't believe we have a fourth community advisory committee meeting on the books yet. Um, we, I think we're going to. And um, the only thing is uh, that, that we can report out is that the April 7th and 8th um, kind of virtual office hours that OP put together, that they had more than, um, more than a dozen people show up. And some of those conversations were like four people within that time period talking with OP. And um, they were supposed to come for the Chevy Chase art, um, art show uh, Sunday past and decided to cancel that and then put more uh, meetings on the books, so to speak, which can be found under publicinput.com forward slash Chevy Chase. And I believe it's, it's this week, there's some meetings. Um, they've also uh, have, um, are gearing up, I think for this visioning survey and also workshop. And we'll ask, I think members of the CAC uh, to help them, you know, to look at those questions in the survey and also maybe to test out the workshop format and so forth. That's what we were told, I think, in our third CAC meeting. Um, and that's, that's really all that I, I have. I mean, we certainly have had two uh, public meetings with uh, OP director Andrew Trueblood come show up. So the April 12th meeting we had, and then the special meeting we had a few days, a week after. Uh, where uh, additional questions were answered by Director Trueblood. So anyone who's here to tonight who didn't get a chance to be present, please go to our YouTube channel, ANC3G, and review those um, that meeting, uh, the recordings, so you could hear the answers. Okay, um, I think uh, that suffices uh, uh, for any report. I, I have no additions to that report. Um, uh, uh, can we turn to the issue of the transmittal of the uh, the community petition to the council and various district agencies? I, I I've circulated several versions of the motion I have made. Um, um, I, I I think we have a, an agreement that the, the the language that I last circulated was acceptable to everybody, um, uh, and so I would move that we. You want to you want to read it, Peter? Going to read it. Yeah. All right. Let me just. Exit this screen. Bear with me. I failed to make a printout of it for this meeting, so I'm going to have to go to my hard drive um, and find V2. There it is. Here it is. Okay. Okay, the motion is the following. 
uh, that uh, moved that the commission transmit the appended uh, petition and signatures of more than 500 Chevy Chase residents asking the DC council mayor and relevant district agencies not to approve any density changes uh, to the future land use map for Upper Connecticut Avenue Northwest as part of the amendments to the district's comprehensive plan until the community has agreed to a small area plan and the council has adopted it and to take further steps as described below. Further, that the commission's transmittal message for the petition read as follows. Dear council member, paren council member, or district official addressed to the appropriate person, attached, please find a petition recently circulated in our community and signed by more than 500 residents expressing the signer's concern that, um, Discussing the signer's concern that already enacted or pending changes to the district's comprehensive plan could jeopardize the integrity of our recently launched Chevy Chase small area plan process. Um, uh, the petition asks the district not to approve density increases for Upper Connecticut Avenue Northwest until our SAP process is complete and the council has adopted the result. It asks that the council restore language to the comprehensive plan designed to ensure that infrastructure keeps pace with population. It asks the Office of Planning to work with the community to conduct and quote, quoting the petition, inclusive, responsive, and transparent, unquote, SAP process that optimizes production of new and pres preservation of existing affordable housing. The next paragraph is, the commission as a whole does not take a position on the substance of the petition, paren, although two commissioners have signed the petition, and paren, but views the document as an expression of concern by a segment of our community. The commission has been asked to transmit the petition to the council and others so that it can be considered in their deliberations and actions. We have agreed to do so. And further, and finally, that the transmittal document be signed by the chair on behalf of the commission and to be delivered immediately. The, the uh, text of the, uh, of the uh, petition and the signatures are appended to the uh, motion. Uh, and so I, I move that, uh, that we approve this. Do I have a second or do I leave this to you, Randy? Second. Thank you. All those, in all those in favor? Or first, is there any discussion? Any discussion by anyone? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor? Seven zero, okay. Okay, good. So uh, let me just turn to the uh, community forum uh, resolution. Um, uh, we, we've, uh, we've discussed uh, uh, for several months our concerns uh, uh, to, that, we, that we work to make sure that the uh, Chevy Chase uh, small area plan process uh, is uh, successful. Uh, we passed resolutions in February and uh, April 12th. Um, uh, um, um, again, trying to be make sure that the, the, the process as it's expressing concern about the process as it's uh, so far been executed and trying to make sure that we preserve uh, the integrity of it and make it a success. Um, in this resolution, um, I, I at least, and I think most of us thought that um, the Office of Planning was going to um, uh, as part of, as, as the centerpiece of, of the small area plan, um, uh, conduct um, community-wide, uh, uh, many community-wide meetings that would let uh, residents speak to each other and, uh, and voice their opinions and change their opinions, um, uh, learn from uh, the discussion uh, about where our community should be headed in the next few years and in the next generation uh, and what physical changes to the community um, would send us in the right direction. Um, it's become clear that, um, um, that actually we are gonna need to step up to the plate and, uh, and do that. Um, I circulated, um, I circulated a, a draft of this uh, to uh, commissioners uh, on April 19th um, I, uh, Chairman uh, Speck, uh, made clear at our last meeting when we discussed our previous resolution that this is a big lift. This is a big, big job, and it is a very difficult job to do democracy virtually. Uh, and um, I appreciate that. I so in addition to circulating the uh, draft 
petition, I circulated an Excel spreadsheet of a, at least an initial schedule of, of work we need to do to try to bring this about. Um, and both uh, uh, Randy and I have taken the first steps in, in that process. Um, we've gone through um, several, um, I've sent out this uh, drafts of this several times to the commissioners uh, and most recently took a few edits from uh, um, Connie, uh, which I've ag agreed to, to, to make uh, in the rationale section of the, uh, of the um, resolution. Um, I can read the, 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 the resolution itself. I, if you really want me to read the, <laughs> the rationale too, I'll do that too, but I've, uh, I've, you've, you've had it before you for some time and that do you, you want the whole nine yards? No, I, it, was this posted on our website? Yes. Okay, uh, that, that, that's sufficient then. I don't think we need to read it at all, really. Okay, okay. Um, so uh, so I, I, I move that, that, that we uh, adopt this resolution. Do I have a second? I, I, Is there a second? Okay. Any discussion? Connie? No, it's John. Okay, John. John. Yeah, I just would like to ask uh, Connie if this is uh, would incorporate or would incorporate some of Connie's ideas for for open forums as she proposed at, at the last session. I think that was a good idea. I'd like to see that in concept incorporated into this uh, resolution. John, what I do in this case is that um, uh, in, in, um, there's enough going on with this that I I I, I didn't uh, consult Connie about the specifics, but in the, the, the third further, it says further that the ANC sponsored community-wide forums be coordinated with outreach efforts by OP and community groups such as historic Chevy Chase DC and the Chevy Chase Citizens Association, as well as workshops, presentations, and discussions facilitated by the commission and others to engage and inform Chevy Chase residents. So I, I acknowledge this is a placeholder, but I recognize that we are going to, I, I, frankly, I recognize in a way that I had not recognized when this, first, this issue first came up, that this is something we're going to have to do. It seems as if there's a great deal more that we're going to have to do to make this process successful than I had thought that we were going to have to do. And I think that Connie's um, proposal, um, uh, working with Connie's proposal, we can come to something about that. But I set a place for it in this proposal. Connie? I think, um, Peter, the, the, that paragraph on further is the coordination piece. So I see it as separate. Yours is about the community forums and it's, that is a huge effort. And for us to be able to execute and get it right, it's gonna take all of us to, to help. Um, and that section on coordinating with other people's outreach and also what we would like to do is um, is what I was discussing last time around, which is a smaller effort. You know, th those are more tactical uh, topics that people are interested in that haven't been explored by anyone else uh, that have come up, you know, through conversations either in public meetings and so forth. It would require, you know, all of us to um, to think about how we would do that. And that's different than what you're doing. So I see it as separate, but definitely coordinated and coordinated with what OP is planning on doing, obviously. So I think the goal here is for us to make this small area plan, the Chibichi small area plan, as successful as possible, as community driven as possible, and to get everyone in conversation, um, but to make sure that the schedule doesn't um, impact, uh, you know, someone else's, doesn't, it doesn't make it confusing to anyone. So um, I would like to be able to bring that up again. I don't know, um, Randy, how you want to uh, to deal with it because right now we have Peter's motion on the table. Right. And Lisa, um, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't, yeah. I, I don't want to cut you off. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa? Yeah, so I'm now confused. <laughs> so there, Peter, your resolution is separate and your engagement sessions are separate than Connie's. Yeah. Is that what we're saying? That's right. I, I consider uh, this resolution to be a statement of our willingness to sponsor large democratic discussions among residents about 
what they think our community is, what it should be, and where it should go. And um, uh, that, out of that will come, I hope, over a very, over many meetings, some consensus about what a vision of the community and a set of policies and changes that we want to see made um, uh, um, uh, uh, in this community to, to advance what we believe it is and should be. Um, the, they're separate from the democratic discussion. So a, all, this, all this discussion of OP doing workshops and the stuff that Connie has proposed, somewhere people have got to take what the, the information they've gotten from those and they got to talk among themselves. Is it important? Isn't it important? Do you believe this? Do I believe that? You know, and, and get to some, um, some consensus. And the only way you're going to get a, cons a political consensus around making changes if people talk to each other. So what I see us as doing is taking on the really formidable task of trying to do democracy in a pandemic and hopefully do it long enough that we get out from under these, uh, enough of these COVID restrictions, we can do some of this stuff in, in, uh, in person. Now, I'm adding, you know, adding, you know, part of this could be a presentation by, by, uh, uh, Mary, Will Merrifield about uh, social housing, but you know, it, but frankly, I think the first meetings have just we've got to reestablish trust uh, that we're going to try to do this right, and that's going to take a messy first meeting where people talk generally about this, and we're going to build from that, but that's going to happen over time. This is just we're trying to create a forum where information from various sort where people can talk among themselves about uh, you know uh, the the the. The, the stuff they learn wherever they learn it, including uh, information and education sessions uh, that are uh, that I see as uh, perhaps add-ons and occurring in this forum, but the forum is important, whatever the whatever the surround is of, uh, of information gathering by citizens. They got to come together and use what information they've gotten um, to to talk among ourselves about where we want to head in this community. Does that help? Does that help yeah, you? I understand that. I guess my question is why are they separate? And um, if you guys have about combining them, it just seems like we have two separate processes going. I know you're trying to aim at some of the same results, but I'm just kind of curious as to why we're doing, well, we've got well, a lot of resolutions out there on this topic. Well, look, I'm, I am happy to entertain uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, a, 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 a separate resolution that effectively amends this and builds it into something bigger. I think that because doing this, uh, setting up this process is going to be so difficult, um, and learning techniques such as we've seen in some of the successful bigger virtual meetings we've been in. For example, with Council Member Lewis George, this is going to be such a big task for a big learning curve for us uh, that we need to get started with uh, the framework. Now, within that framework, I, <clears throat> because I because I've come to the conclusion that so much more of this is on our shoulders than I thought was going to be on our shoulders, I am happy to 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 find to to to. Uh, you know, as we go along, and indeed, soon after we get the basic, you know, stru structure of the technology and the facilitation down, to to you have, have this framework put to to many uses. But uh, I'd argue right now that I, we shouldn't, given the the discussion and the disagreements we've had about the education component about Connie's resolution over these months, that we should get this process started. And most importantly, I think what happens here by passing this resolution is we say to the community, look, you know, you haven't had a forum yet and we're gonna do something about that. And we say to ourselves, man, have we got a lot of work to do, <laughs> so. So why would we want to delay uh, 
any of these programs though, and Connie's proposals as well, because it seems to me we're behind the eight ball already. We need, uh, granted it's gonna, as I've emphasized before, it is gonna be a heavy lift to do the kind of thing you've got in mind, Peter. But I think we can also be working on at the same time, some other forums, some smaller forums perhaps, that don't include, uh, don't, don't have to include uh, you know, 300 people at a time, but that can, can provide some further opportunities for engagement. And you know, I think Connie's proposal is still one that a number of us at least still believe is important and valid. And I don't want to delay that um, because we're, we're still trying to figure out what to do on a larger scale. Uh, I, let's see, uh, we've had discussions over the last several meetings of the substance of that. I'm happy to add a, a further that says something to the effect that uh, the commission will also work to, um, to, uh, to, find, to, to, to build a, a set of information uh, and educational um, uh, 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 workshops and discussions and- We don't- tapes. We don't need to. I have my resolution on the table, so I don't think we have to. I think, I think, I think the coordination part, as your resolution states in that third further, allows for coordination. I don't think we have to mix it together. We're the same commission, so these resolutions. We had the February twenty second one, which was, you know, asking OP to do more, uh, and now we have this one. We have many. We're going to continue to have more, I'm sure, as things can as things go on. You know, as the small area plan moves forward. So my resolution is there. It's been shared in public. The background document is there, and the resolution itself is there. And we've had a discussion. And um, I'm very willing to work with everyone. But it's not a big thing. These are not going to be big things. It's going to be like what the historic Chevy Chase DC has put together: small zoominars, you know, smaller things. But we get the right people to the table so that we can learn more. We could have a more informed community engagement. That's, that's, the, that's the idea. And yours is much bigger. Yours is more community member, community member, and, and driving those discussions you know, among people. And hopefully with OP observing so that they can learn what, what was said, um, right? Which is something you and I have talked about, Peter. Well, well so what's the, what's the sense of the commission? I, I guess I hear from Connie that you want to subsequent to voting on this, you or I think what Kanye is saying is vote on the the, the, the education uh, resolution separately. Is that correct? Uh, I mean, I'm happy to take up that discussion again. I had not prepared for that, but I'm I'm happy to do that. I think that this. I think that the the the, the problem I'm trying to address with this is that people talking to each other and not just in small numbers, in big numbers, right. um, is a way you get to a political consensus. Uh, it's one way, it's it, one way. It's one way, it, but they, they, you know, it is an important way and it, people need to have, need to take information from many sources and exchange it between each other and debate whether, what, how to weigh it. And that's what I'm trying to address in this. I'm trying to provide the forum um, to have that broad discussion. Now, I, I hope that- Peter, I mean, let's, have, let's have Michael talk. So, oh, Michael and John. Michael, or oh, oh, first, excuse me, Michael. John had his hand up first. John and then Michael. Um, Connie, would you be um, amenable to having a, an, an amendment to, to Peter's resolution that specifically incorporates your suggestion as part of that outreach effort? Would that procedurally work for you? I, I, I personally think we should just vote on, vote on Peter's as is that we've seen. Um, I think we know what it is. And I think that he's been very clear about the community forums. And I think then we can bring up mine that was in the kind of in the ethernet and we could talk about that. Um, that that's what I would prefer because it's different. These are different ideas. Uh, it's the same commission, but it's different ideas and it's getting at this differently. So it's okay. I mean, I, I, I think we can have that, that discussion, um, which we, you know, which we kind yeah. of held at bay Michael? last time. 
So, so I'm completely flummoxed. Uh, it seems to me that that these two resolutions are not in conflict whatsoever. They're just two approaches to addressing the same issue of community yeah. engagement. And and Connie has one way of, of, of doing it. And Peter, you have a, another way of doing it. As I say, they're they're completely symbiotic. So what is what are we debating here? We can pass both of these resolutions and let these proceedings proceed in, in, in parallel when they're in parallel and let them intersect um, when when they intersect. Uh, I, I just I'm just as I say I don't understand what the what the discussion is. What we're, what we're aiming for is community engagement in 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 a process that I think uh, I am deeply worried about. I didn't raise this in respect to the transmission of the um, the petition, but my view is is that if Mendelssohn and company don't change the comp plan back to the original form, then we should um, revoke our support for density that this commission agreed to in 2020, um, because they'll have completely undermined the legitimacy of the small area plan process and the weight we think it should have in the comprehensive plan zoning analysis. So these things take place at a macro and a micro level. I think we should proceed with both of them, see what the commission does, and then decide what you know, okay. continuing steps we want to take. Okay. So with regard to what you just said, Michael, I'm, you know, I'm happy to discuss that, the issue of, uh, and I want to talk to uh, Randy about the issue of the council's reaction to our previous uh, resolution. If I understand it correctly, there's an interest in the part of the commission on voting of both of these tonight, and that's fine. Um, I'd suggest that we vote on the one before you uh, and then take up money. I mean, no problem with it. Unless somebody has a, a strong objection, let I'll call the vote. And on your motion, Peter, uh, is there is there any objection to going ahead with a vote? Anybody have something vital to say about that? And then, um, then we'll turn Randy. Yes, to, we'll turn. To we'll turn to Connie's. We'll turn to yeah, Connie's okay. immediately. Okay. Okay. All those. Uh, there was. It's been a. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor? Seven zero. Okay. Now, Connie, uh, you want to make your motion and. Uh, you know, I think everybody understands what it is, so just uh, we can make your motion and we can discuss it then, hopefully briefly, and then uh, take a vote on it. Sure. Um, I, my motion is to first to carry out a community outreach program and to so that we can bolster and ensure community broad community engagement, uh, transparency and information exchange regarding this uh, Chevy Chase small area plan process. Um, and the goal here is to um, be responsive to questions that have come up um, on uh, the neighborhood development. You know, what, I mean, from housing, different types of housing, from different kinds of developers and development to other questions that might come up. I mean, we talked about social housing and so forth, but it would be all community driven. And, um, and if it's not been done, we should think about doing it. And we could all come together and decide uh, who we could partner with to make sure that just like other organizations um, in our community have done to put something together and to bring people and just post it and say, if you wanna learn about this, come. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's a different way of engaging people. And it's also to make sure that any of these kind of newer or more obscure ideas, maybe we could just give it some more attention to just see uh, other people's experience. So that's my, that's my intention of this outreach program is to have those conversations and to um, have a better informed uh, engagement uh, with the community. Right. Michael? Yeah. Yes, and, and to, um, to the comment um, by Jamie Butler in the, in the chat, I think Jamie, the answer to the question is to, to be determined. How will these fora be structured? That'll be something that you hopefully will participate in and help us um, make sure that these are productive conversations driving toward some sort of consensus. But I don't think there's a predetermined plan for how these things will go. And they'll, I think they'll go differently on a topic by topic basis. Is that right, Connie? Yeah, I mean, the difference between the two is 
is Peter wants. No, no I'm talking about big, your, just yours alone. Oh, no, just my, yeah. You. My, well, Jamie's is about, I think hers is about Peter. Um, and the next question is about mine. So, um, so Peter's, I think he, he's, he said for those big community forums, there's a lot of work to figuring out how to execute that. So everyone is heard, right? Because our experience with people just sitting on Zoom and then trying to call in and asking a question, it just really doesn't work. And it's still like 2D. So trying to get people together where they talk and they can go into a breakout room and come back and all that will take some um, expertise. And that's something that Peter wants to work on. What I'm doing is not those big things. What I'm, my intention is, it's a uh, Who's done, who's done social housing? You know, people have talked about Singapore and Amsterdam and other places, you know, to learn more about it. And how could it be applied here? That would be like one topic. You know, there, there are other questions about like, how do we get deeply affordable housing here? Like in a place like ours to, to just grapple with some of these questions. There's several of these and we can figure out a matrix. We can figure out how to do it and when to do it. We could all talk about that together. Um, and I'm, I'm very prepared to, to look at all the chats and the Q and A's we've had in the past, and then for us to decide what we can manage and who we can bring to the table. And if there's no expert, then it's not gonna be a fruitful exchange of information, but it's really with, with it's, a, it's more of a learning process. And what Peter wants is more of a conversation between residents, okay, to get at what is it they wanna see in the neighborhood. Mine is, mine is different. One, one other thing too, Connie, that I think we talked about before and that Lisa's brought up is that we need to get people from, from different points of view from outside our community uh, to come and talk about their view of uh, affordable housing and what it ought to be in our neighborhood. Uh, yes. And that's uh, a, a part of it as well. Uh, we're, we're, this is not gonna be just uh, all of us getting together and talking to each mm -hmm. other. It, 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 we're, we're, yeah. We want to get some people from outside our neighborhood who have different experiences, come yes. with a different point of view and can enlighten us uh, and, and help us engage better on these important issues. So I, you know, I see this as vitally important uh, as a part to, to expand our horizons uh, in, a, in a significant way. Yeah, that, um, thanks for bringing that up, Randy, because you know, I'm not sure if we're voting on Connie's original motion. Is this just the words, Connie? I don't know what we're really voting on here um, because it wasn't passed out prior to the meeting, but I still echo those sentiments very strongly. Commission involvement and in voices outside of this community as well. We can't do either one of your sessions in a vacuum. And I would really like both of your commitments on that. So oh, yeah. that yeah, we yeah, make yeah, sure no. that, okay, mm -hmm. I really want a commitment mm -hmm. to that because um, we all need to be involved and we, we all need to have some, you know, say so in how this is going. Yeah. Um, so I would like to see, you know, a combined effort on a commission. And I, I know you guys have different approaches, but it just seems to me that we could do this real smoothly as one commission with, you know, even maybe a committee <laughs> that handles this mm -hmm. as opposed to two commissioners kind of going off and doing it. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, whatever. I, I agree with that. And, <laughs> you know, what, I, what I want, we haven't fleshed out either of these proposals, Peter's mm -hmm. or Connie's. They're not fleshed out. Mm -hmm. But we can't just sit on our hands and, until miraculously it gets fle fleshed out. We've got to start working on it. And oh, we've got, to, start, and <laughs> we've got to come up with some proposals. And we got to, and so I, I think we ought to give at least the sense of the commission at this point that th these, both of these proposals should go forward, that um, we ought to be pursuing both of these avenues to engage with the community. And I, both of them need to be fleshed out more. There's no question about that. And I, we, if we want to appoint a committee to do that, or we want to work on all seven of us working together on it, which is fine with me, then that's the way we need to proceed. But, you know, we need to move forward and we cannot afford to continue to debate how we're going to do this. Uh, we've got to go ahead and decide. We've just got to decide and do it. Peter? Uh, yeah, a couple of things. I, I hope 
um, that with regard to um, Connie's proposal that you hear Lisa, I mean, I think one of the concerns is that we've, this commission in the three and a half months we've been together has found a lot of things to disagree with uh, about. And um, we wanna be sure that, that we work as a group uh, on, on these uh, information education um, uh, um, efforts. On the other side, I wanna clarify something that uh, in my conversation, my telephone conversation with Connie today that really surprised me, um, which may be a misperception on Connie's side and Randy, your side about my notions about these broader meetings, which is that I wanted to exclude OP. I mean, uh, there's, there's no- that's not, that's, not a, that's not a consideration. Okay, but, but I just want to say on, the, on a balancing, it, on balancing concerns on both sides, I want to assure you that I have no intention nor the capacity to do that. So just, uh, um, I, I offer that. that. That was never, in my mind, it never, never crossed my mind. Um, I, I just want to emphasize, um, someone raised a, a comment in the chat that will people you want to bring in from outside the community all represent, represent the smart growth community, which seems to be what's happened so far with a ta the task force. What we're bringing in are people who have different views than ours, people, who, mm -hmm. people of color, people who, who, mm -hmm. who are not wealthy, uh, people who have not lived in this exactly. neighborhood, but would like to live in this neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know, who were excluded from this neighborhood for, for generations. You now that those are the people we want to involve in this. And, you know, that that's a viewpoint that none of us around this table with Lisa's as, as an exception, I think, can really speak to in any significant way. Uh, and we need that point of view. So, I'm hoping that that's what we're going to be mm -hmm. reaching out for. And we're gonna get a wide range of viewpoints. That's the only way we're gonna be able to assess what mm -hmm. is really gonna be best for this community and best for the city. Okay, John. Um, would it be possible procedurally to vote on Connie's motion? Obviously, the timing dates in her in her right. motion have, have passed. We could just leave those indefinite. Yeah. No. And, I, uh, well, I, or, or 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 put in some date. You, you know, but obviously, I, change the dates and pass her and pass her or change the dates and vote on her proposal. I would like to vote on her proposal with a, the understanding that it's going to be fleshed out more with the agreement of all the commissioners as we go forward. Absolutely. And that will be sufficient. I mean, we don't have to have every T crossed and I dotted in order to pass this resolution. I think we need to move on. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, there's one. In, okay. Uh, I will call the vote then. It's been, um, motion's been made. Was there a second? Yes, there was a second. Yes. Okay. All those in favor of uh, Connie's motion? Michael. Michael, we can't see you. Okay. <laughs> seven, seven zero. Okay. Thank you very much. That's Thank great. You. Now we can move on uh, to another resolution. <laughs> Wait, so let's just, uh, on the, 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 I want to go back to just one more thing. Okay. The, 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 a, a brief discussion of the council's reaction to our April 12th resolution. Um, the concerns Michael expressed, I think are serious. And I, I wonder whether there are um, further steps that we either needed now or that we should contemplate uh, very quickly. Um, yes. Um, so uh, yeah, what can, I, can I offer steps? Yeah. We wrote, we wrote strong emails to every council member, including the chair and uh, that, that email was approved by all the, the commissioners. And it was, a, I think, a very strong uh, insistence that they go back to the, uh, I think it's the April 15th language that was in the, the comp plan, in, in the uh, amendments to the comp plan and not the April 20th. 
I have gotten communications back from several of the council members, uh, not just staffs, but the council members themselves saying, yes, I will pay attention to this. It's on my radar. Uh, we're going to look into it. My view is all of us need to continue to push the council members between now and May 4th. There's going to be a first vote on May 4th. Uh, we need to emphasize, especially to council member Che and council member Lewis George, but also to all of the at-large council members and to any other council member where we think we might have some influence, um, that this is important to us. It needs to be fixed. And I, I think we'll get it fixed. Um, I'm pretty confident of that. If, we're, if we persist in lobbying our council members, um, and that's, that's our job at this mm -hmm. point. So I wanna focus all of our efforts on doing that. All I raised, Randy, was that um, should that effort fail? I don't expect it to. I, fine. I don't expect it to either. But that's, I have a lot of expectations that gets disappointed in life. If, if this doesn't pass, all I want is consensus among us that we will figure out what next steps to take, including the possibility of not um, supporting the density increases from 2020. Well, it, it will not be, I, I don't know what, we, what effect that would have because by then the comp plan will have been adopted by the council. We'll, because can, show our, we'll can show our disapproval of their process in some way. We can yeah. show our disapproval of the process. I don't have any problem with that, but I, I think asking for them to go back and, and change the uh, comp plan that they've already just approved uh, is probably- No, 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 I, I think, no, no, we're, we're, we're saying the same thing, that we try to get them mm -hmm. to go back to their original mm -hmm. language. All right. I'm saying is among us that if we don't succeed, and I know you think we will, but if we don't succeed, then I think we need to have a strong statement of disapproval because if we don't succeed the whole small area planning process that we're undertaking has much less meaning well it's it's jeopardized it's it's jeopardized i don't i don't disagree with that yeah. Peter? That's all, that's all just, just, just a point of information um is the second vote when is the council's second vote and is that a um is that just a ministerial thing? Is the real vote no. forth? No, it's not a ministerial thing. So things get changed between the first and second vote. And when is the second vote likely? I, I think it's two weeks after the first vote. I believe so, that's correct. So we have a meeting in between? Yes. Okay, okay. Well, we can, we can defer that to then. Um, uh, I, 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 I mean, I... I must say one of the things that, and this has been one of the things that, as you say, Randy, we have to move forward and I agree with that. But I, one of the things that I think is uh, uh, tainting the process and confusing the public is there's a sort of back and forth about um, how much uh, weight uh, the small area plan, any small area plan has. And um, I have some other ideas about how we might give it more weight uh, if we don't get the you know some some the language we need the minimum language we need in the comp plan to protect to protect our our small air plan, planning process but we have merit apparently we have a one meeting to do something about we, that. we can wait and see what happens and in the meantime though besides just waiting i encourage every commissioner to mm. contact the council members directly individually we've done it as a commission but you know, the more times we emphasize to them that that's important to us, uh, the better. If we can get our constituents to call their council member, write their council member, that's important too. But this is something that I think we can get if we're smart about uh, working with the council uh, and the council members who have some clout at the council. So let's just, put our shoulders to the wheel and do it. Okay. Okay. 
All right, now we can go to the next resolution. Um, uh, this is a resolution on surveillance, and we had a, a commission meeting, um, I guess it was back at the end of March, is that right? Um, on the topic March 22nd. of- March 22nd. And, uh, and Lisa has been shepherding this issue and has now prepared a resolution for the commission's consideration. Lisa, you want to describe it and offer your motion? Yes. Um, so just as background, um, one of my constituents, and I believe Rachel is um, hopefully here, uh, brought this to my attention. And it's basically a front end, thank you, Rachel, she's here, <laughs> a front end oversight um, legislative proposal on the use, uh, acquisition, and uh, data usage of police surveillance technology. So the concern here, and I'm gonna promote Rachel just in case she wants to add on to what I'm saying. The concern here is how that surveillance technology is used in the community and the potential ramifications. So specifically communities of color, um, communities of different sexual orientation, and it provides the community with actually some input and the council as well, the proposed legislation to um, be able to provide some over accountability and oversight of the surveillance usage. So it is important. Um, Rachel did a presentation. Uh, I believe hopefully we have her presentation up on the ANC website. The proposed resolution is on the ANC website. We had some very minor changes that I sent to the commission earlier today. Um, and I won't read through the whole resolution, but it's, uh, I think a really important piece of proposed uh, legislation that COST DC is trying to get through our council. Uh, one of the things that recently happened since Rachel presented on April 1st and I, kind of gave you guys a highlight of one section of the DC um, Police Reform Commission report, but they actually, this part I will read, they actually did recommend this particular oversight accountability issue. They stated in their report, the council should pass legislation to ensure that decisions about whether district agencies should acquire, use, or share, or share surveillance technologies are made with thoughtful consideration and buy-in from the public and elected lawmakers. And the operation of approved technologies is governed by rules that safeguard residents' rights and provide transparency. This legislation should, among other provisions set out below, include the creation of a surveillance advisory group and establish a private right of action for violations of council approved rules for the acquisition or use of any surveillance technology. So that type of technology um, stingrays, uh, trap and, you know, trace, cell phone readers, there's all kind of police surveillance technology that's out there that's instituted and used with the public. Um, I don't even think the public gets a really good insight into the back end uses of the data, but this will provide legislation that says, you know, prior to procurement, and Rachel can go into the legislation in a little bit in more detail that there's an accountability piece and there's actually a group that looks at that. Um, so hopefully we have commission support. Um, I move that we adopt the resolution as provided with the edits as amended. Is there a second? Peter? Okay. Um, any discussion from the commissioners? Any discussion from the community? <laughs> if you have any questions, raise your hand. I don't see any questions on this. Rachel, you want to add to anything that I said? No. She says no. <laughs> take advantage of the silence. No, I'm, I'm really grateful to the commission for considering this. I know we had a chance at the last meeting to talk about it in detail. Obviously happy to answer any questions, but uh, no, just excited to see this go forward. Randy, you wanna call for a vote? You're on mute. <laughs> All those in favor of the motion? 
seven zero. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, y'all. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was really exciting. Thank you. Okay, the, the last substantive item on our agenda is uh, the discussion possible vote on a resolution on DDOT's uh, Connecticut Avenue reversible lane study. And uh, this has uh, certainly provoked a lot of interest. Uh, I've gotten many, many, many phone calls and emails and lots of other things um, about it. And it goes back to at least 2018 when this commission urged DDOT to conduct a study and specified some parameters of things we thought were important uh, in that study. And then um, beginning at the beginning of uh, 2020, uh, Chris and I have been meeting with DDOT. Uh, they formed a citizens advisory committee. Uh, Chris and I have attended uh, three different meetings uh, that they had for the advisory committee. We've had one briefing for the full commission uh, in I think January uh, of this year, January, February. Uh, there have been a couple of public meetings as well. And so a lot of information has been uh, disseminated by DDOT, uh, collected and disseminated. Um, and uh, there is a May 1st deadline for public comments. I've been advised that uh, that's not, uh, ANCs could make comments later, but I think uh, the feeling about, among the commissioners now is that we might just go ahead and uh, make our comments now. Uh, I'm not sure that anything's gonna change significantly between now and some later time in, in May. Um, so um, uh, Lisa and Michael, you want to begin with your resolution? And we'll start with that. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Randy. Um, both me and Michael will comment on it and um, I'll just kind of go first. So definitely thank you to Michael and uh, all the people that helped us get this resolution drafted. I think um, one of the things, I've been a strong supporter of Concept C even before I knew there was a Concept C. And um, that's because I support bike lanes. And, and part of that is from a personal experience. Some of you all know this experience, but my son was actually um, in a vehicle accident on a bike. We were out of the country and he was doing everything right. I was right behind him and a huge, one of those big, huge Mercedes decided to take advantage of the gap that he had left in front of the uh, bicycle tour leader that was in front of him. So as a parent, I watched my son, who at the time was 14, collide with a, a Mercedes very hard, um, completely destroyed that quarter panel. I don't know how he stayed up on that bike, but he managed to make it through. Um, but you know, looking at that in slow motion, as a parent was extremely troubling. And it just, it changed my view. Um, concept, so this concept means a lot to me and it is a safety issue with our community. I can't stress that enough. Um, and you guys will probably know, I tell a lot of stories to try to relate. You know, coming out of my career in uh, as a manager in law enforcement, one of the things that we always strive to do is officer safety. That's something that you always hear. It's number one, officer safety. And I kind of transitioned that and put that lens on when I look at this issue in terms of public safety. Public safety is number one with me when it comes to this issue. I know we are going to have to give up parking we're gonna to have to give up you know, some diversion of traffic in some areas. There are trade-offs that we are gonna have, but none of those are worth relinquishing our public safety. We just heard Mary Che um, propose a round table on safety issues. And we just got out of the meeting with Mary Che where we discussed bike lanes and she's a huge um, supporter of Concept C and, you know, this is something that she really wants to see, and she has been advocating for years. Mm -hmm. um, I also look at this as a visioning issue. 
we're in a process where we have an opportunity. We're going through the SAP, we're going through the comp plan where our community is going to change. And that's what we're looking at now. How is our community going to change and how do we want to see that change in the future? So I'm not necessarily looking at, you know, the reversible lane project as a here and now that would be nice if it was here and now, but it is how I want to see the community going forward whenever that point in time is in the future. So we hear a lot about, you know, people want that village feel. We want to maintain a certain feel in Chevy Chase. I don't want to maintain a feeling in Chevy Chase where I have six lanes of traffic whizzing up and down, you know, the avenue. Most of those drivers from Maryland, most of those drivers are commuting in, going downtown DC, and the people that are really trying to enjoy you know, the livability here, the walkability here are in jeopardy, literally with their lives at risk. The other thing is we were on an excursion when my son had his accident, but people have bicycles as a form and means of transportation. The road is shared and should be shared with them, but it should be done so in a protected manner. So that's why we have the protected bike lane. I think going back to 2014, I actually took some notes, moved DC and um, 2014 and 21, designated or identified Connecticut Avenue as a bike priority corridor. So I know there's been some discussion about, you know, well, why do we need bike lane? But going back to 2014, this city has been trying to make that corridor, Connecticut Avenue, mm -hmm. a priority for bicyclists. So it's uh, really with me a safety issue. I really employ the um, commissioners to think about it that way. Um, you know, we really don't know in terms of data what things are going to look like. We just coming out of COVID. We've had to make a lot of changes because of that. I hope we don't have the same traffic volume. I think one thing COVID has showed us that, you know, people make do. Um, and if we have changes in this community, as a community, we are going to make do. So we're, we're going to still support our businesses. All of our businesses primarily around that avenue have parking in the back lots. It might not be as convenient as it, as it was, but we have to ask ourselves, what's the trade-off to that? Um, and we still have a lot of time to work with DDOT. We are probably at 10, 15% in terms of the design process. We're not even in a design process. We're right now in comment mm -hmm. period. So we have a lot of time to interact with DDOT and make them aware of our concerns with moving forward and to be involved in that design process, just like we're involved in the design process mm -hmm. with the comp plan and the SAP. So if we take this vote tonight and we pass concept C, it's not the end, it's just the beginning. We're letting DDOT know where our priorities lie. And um, hopefully that is with concept C. So Michael? Right, so to be clear, our resolution supports concept C, which is a design of Connecticut Avenue that has bike lanes on both sides and eliminates parking on one side, but retains it on the other side. It also eliminates the uh, crossover um, during rush hour from th two lanes to, to three lanes. Um, we, we note in our resolution that while we support concept C, which is the bike lane and end of the exchange of lanes, we recognize that there are diversion and parking issues that need to be addressed. And we say, therefore, that while, our, while we support concept C, we request that DDOT and we expect that DDOT work with the community to take all the remedial steps necessary to mitigate to the maximum extent possible any impact that the exception, the adoption of concept C would provide for. So we are very cognizant of the fact that concept C is in, it, in essence an overarching vision. It says at a macro level, we support in concept 
bicycle lanes with one side that still retains parking and a recognition that working with the diversion of traffic is a necessity. That once that is passed, as would be consistent with every ANC up and down Connecticut Avenue, every the, the ANCs have voted on um, concept C, B, and the others in each of the other ANCs. And the vote has been, I believe, Connie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, 17 in favor, one against, one abstention. And everybody, in, whether it's in our community or um, down the road, um, recognizes that we're talking about the overarching vision and that as I spoke tonight with Ed Stoloff, um, who is the manager of the project planning branch um, that, that's overseeing this. And he said that what he's looking for from us is this exception, acceptance of an overarching vision with the recognition that design, the design details will follow, that there is an expectation on the, his part that there will be public meetings in the fall and that during that fall um, process, we'll discuss in greater detail things like, should the parking um, be on the east or the west side of the street? Should the stanchions that um, divide the bicycle lanes from the traffic be at first plastic and to see how they run and so that if they're not uh, meeting expectations, theory versus practice, they can be easily removed before we pour concrete. All of those sorts of things are to be done in phase two. So really what we're doing here, and he said to me categorically, I said, well, you know, some on our commission are seeking more data based on their roles in the um, planning process. And he said, quote, the consultant will not be analyzing data any longer. The data is as the data is. You will not be getting any more data. So we have to accept the data as the data is, whether we like it or not. Mary Chase said on a phone call with us tonight, with Lisa and me tonight, that the, the lane change is a foregone conclusion, that they are, they are getting rid of that changing lanes. The data is, to everybody's mind on the council, overwhelming that it's dangerous. And she said, it's foregone. What we're talking about now is the design of the bike lanes on Connecticut Avenue. And, and our resolution suggests that Concept C is the safest for the bicyclists, the best for our business community, will provide the greatest amount of opportunity for us to impact the design details of it. And, and that's why we ask for your support um, this evening. Our, our view is now, my view is now, um, that we have 40-something uh, people on this phone call. I bet you 35 of them are here for, for this conversation, that we, at this hour of the night, turn this over to the community so we can hear from them. And then we as commissioners continue our conversation after we've had feedback from the community. Randy, you're Randy, muted. You're mute. Any other commission, commissioners want to say anything? I'd be happy to uh, say something if the sense of the commission is they want to hear from the public, it's fine with me. Yeah, what, what do we want to do? Do we want to say something later, Randy, or now? Um, it's, it's really up to the commissioners. What do, what do you want to do? You want to just hear from the community now? Okay, that's fine. How do you want? I, yeah, I, I think I, I think they want to go now because it's getting okay. late. So let's hear from them because we know okay. what we're going to say. I mean, okay. Uh, I, what I'm going to say is not not going to take very long. But yeah. um, if we want to uh, hear from the com community, let's have everyone who wish, wishes to speak. Uh, can can we first get a count? Everyone who wishes to speak, if you could raise your hand. See how many hands we have raised. Is that 11? 11. And I promoted Josh. I think I tried to promote Bo. 
So it's okay. going to promote like two or three at a time, Randy. Okay, but let's let's keep everyone to three minutes, and I'm going to keep time. I mean, we've just got too many people to go on tonight for everybody to talk longer than that. So, and please, as well, try not to repeat what other people have said. Um, I mean, there's no need to to do that. You can just say you subscribe to their their view as well, and I will let you know when you're when you're down to your three minutes. Okay. Um, Josh, then Josh Rose, first. then Swale. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much. Hi, commissioners, and thanks for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Josh Rising. I live by Chevy Chase Circle, and I helped start Ward 3 Bicycle Advocates a few years back. Um, I think as many people on this call may know, but others may not, there is virtually no safe protected infrastructure in Ward 3 for people who are interested in bicycling. But in fact, there's a grand total of one block. There is one block of a protected out uh, bike lane outside of GDS school in Tenley Town. Other than that, if you are interested in bicycling safely throughout Ward 3, there is virtually no place to do that. If you want to commute downtown, if you're a kid who wants to bike to school, if you're someone who wants to see friends or shop at the local businesses, there is no safe bicycle structure any place in Ward 3. So Connecticut Avenue is a fantastic place to start doing this. It's a place for people to bike downtown for work. There are a ton of schools along the corridor. Right now, there's no safe way for my kids to bike to deal. There's sixth graders and eighth graders there. There's an incredibly narrow sidewalk on Nebraska. There's a couple sidewalks on Connecticut. But if you have people bike on sidewalks, people are going to yell at the people biking on sidewalks, right? So we need to install some safe bicycle infrastructure here in Ward 3. Connecticut Avenue is the place to start with that. There's been a ton of support. 19 commissioners have voted so far in favor of Concept C, and only one commissioner has voted against it. Um, one other thing I want to point out is that there's a lot of concern about the business community, and I totally understand that concern. Um, this is an issue that has been incredibly well studied because every time somebody proposes putting in bike lanes, businesses and others say, oh, this is going to hurt our business. So it's been studied and studied and then studied some more. And every single study has found that either it helps businesses or it has no effect on businesses. And now why is that? Well, it's because the people who are driving by are really not interested in stopping. They're trying to get home to Maryland or someplace else. It's also difficult for them to pull over because there's never enough parking. So there's no way to ever accommodate kind of that parking demand. However, people on bicycles, you're going more slowly, you see an interesting business, it's easy to stop. It's easy for bicycles to park just about anywhere. So the fact that businesses are concerned, I understand that change is always difficult for all of us. Uh, however, the studies really support that bicycle lanes don't hurt and can even help businesses that are out there. Um, thanks again for your time, commissioners. This is an important safety issue, um, and it's the right thing to do to get some safe ways for people who want to bike around the city. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Josh. Bo? Thank you. Uh, I apologize for letting. I'm currently cooking dinner on vacation, but you know I consider this too important to not weigh in. First, thank you for considering this resolution. Uh, by way of introductions, my name is Bo Finley. I'm chair of ANC 3C, commissioner from the Fighting 3C04, which is the eastern side of uh, Cleveland Park Bus Business District. I'll put my glass of wine down so you can take me more seriously. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, DDOT presented the results of its study of the Connecticut, of the Connecticut Avenue reversible lanes uh, at our uh, at a special meeting on Fe February 23rd. Shortly thereafter, several commissioners, including Commissioner Siddiqui, who's on this call, convened and researched possible effects of uh, our uh, on our businesses of the replacement of parking outside. Uh, um, of business districts with protected bicycle lanes and the data is overwhelming. Um, the addition of bike lanes benefits businesses. So, you know, any concerns you have about businesses, we can give you the data, we have it. We, there's plenty that supports, uh, supports bike lanes. And if your concern is diversion and new speeding traffic on like, let's say Chevy Chase Parkway, 41st Street, Reno, uh, don't worry, more traffic means slower traffic. Um, in our April meeting last week, ANC 3C considered a resolution supporting Concept C. Uh, we had 20 people, 22 people, I think, uh, and Commissioner Siddiqui, please correct me if I'm wrong, who commented during our meeting, 19 of those uh, people, 18 of whom are residents by my count, supported Concept C. 
Uh, this aligns with the support we received via email of about 80% support for Concept C. Many folks shared their or their child, and Commissioner Gore, uh, you know, I'm very sorry for what happened to you and your son, uh, but many people shared their, their trauma of what happened to them just by legally riding a bicycle on Connecticut Avenue and what happened, their experiences, frankly, are shocking. Uh, I'm, I'm not an avid cyclist. I've ridden on Connecticut Avenue and is, and my uh, wife used to live in uh, 3G07 and uh, biking back from her place to my place at the time was, um, was terrifying. Anyhow, uh, ANC3C voted in support of Concept C with uh, seven votes in favor. We hold the only uh, abstention and the only opposition to Concept C. Uh, so it was seven to one to one. All that being said, I understand um, your commission has an issue has cropped up with ours, namely timeliness of com comments with DDOT. Uh, we also had uh, commissioners who were, who were thinking that the May 1st deadline was too soon, despite the you know, two and a half, three years of, of comment we've had on this. Uh, and um, what we heard from DDOT was that they will begin uh, crafting the recommendation at, on May 1st, once pu public comment is in. And that recommendation will go from DDOT, the DDOT project team to their supervisors on May 15th. Did you wrap it up? Yep, wrapping up. If you want your comments considered in the drafting, so in the consideration of DDOT's recommendations, then you should comment now. If you want to only have your resolution attached as an appendix, DDOT will continue to consider ANC resolutions, I think, as you point out, until June, but will not be using them when they craft their uh, proposal. Commissioner Siddiqui. Thank you, Bo. Thank you so much. Um, I won't repeat what Commissioner Finley said, um, but I'll first speak as a commissioner. Um, I think, you know, as commissioners, like one of the hardest things for us to do is impact um, our world and impact our neighborhood. I want to tell you all that with this one, you have a chance not just to impact your neighborhood, you have a chance to impact my neighborhood. My constituents will be safer depending on what you do today. And that is one of the reasons why I was so proud to vote for Concept C and one of the reasons I really encourage you all um, to think broader than this. Um, and of course, I know climate change has been brought up again and again and again. We feel helpless so many of the times on how we're gonna tackle that problem. But again, you as commissioners can actually do this right now and do it really, really well. The other thing I wanted to point out um, was that we, I counted all the emails I received uh, for our resolution. I received 104 emails. And I wanna tell you 12 of those, which is, I know small, but 12 of those were from your ANC. And they emailed us saying that we want you to accept this because we know that if our ANC doesn't, then you will. And I asked them all to email you all as well. And they said that they would. Um, so I've heard from your constituents, from my constituents, I ask you to please vote for this. I'm telling you that as a commission, this can be very useful for you. Um, the word C in this case stands for compromise. I know it's really hard for commissions to vote on controversial things, but this one, it gives you allowance for parking. It gives you allowance for bicycle lanes. The best thing it gives you is flexibility for the future. I wanna speak for a second as a scientist because this is my area of research. I'm in my office right now. The books back there are all about mathematical modeling of infrastructure systems. Um, Commissioner Finley already talked about the business impact. I can talk about a little bit of the modeling of the traffic side. Let me tell you, I agree with you. There are problems with DDoT's modeling, but I say that the bicycle crashes are underestimated. The total crashes are underestimated. If you look at the literature, the diversions are overestimated. The traffic impacts are overestimated. DDoT didn't consider modal shifts when they modeled this. Um, and the number of bicycles that they claim is more than 3,000 is also underestimated. Bicycling is expected to be way, way higher. And so I'm happy to talk about that. I'm happy to send you citations. You're right, the data is not enough, but it is enough to make this decision that nothing bad will happen and enough for the future planning. Um, and I end, wanna end with one final thing. Your commission does so many progressive and good things. Um, your commission has the task force on racism in white ward three, you have that. Like it is amazing the amount of stuff you've done. Um, it is amazing how you went through the small area plan and all the stuff you did. It is a model for other neighborhoods. So please, please, please work through this choose the flexible option and work through it, and then have a resolution that supports Concept C so you can help us all. So thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, James? Hi, yeah, thanks for the chance to talk. I uh, will try to say something a little different. 
I live uh, here in, uh, in this ANC, uh, basically the corner of 33rd Street and Morrison. I bike all the time. It's, it's uh, a passion of mine and my primary form of transportation. I'm scared to death of Connecticut Avenue. I have done it. And I go back and forth between sidewalks when there aren't as so many people on the sidewalks or in the street when there aren't so many cars. And I'm tired of being an orphan in my own area. <laughs> I'd like to have a place where bikes are at home and not I'm not either endangering a pedestrian or being endangered by a car. <clears throat> Excuse me, another point that hasn't been made, there's a lot of evidence that, I mean, I'm a passionate biker, I'm gonna bike, but there's a lot of evidence that there are, most people will bike if there's a protected bike lane, and if there's not a protected bike lane, they will not bike. Having been struck by a car myself, I was touched by Commissioner Gore's story. I was struck, fortunately, by a slow-moving car, uh, so I understand that. And so uh, I regard it not only as a safety issue, but as a health issue, because bikes do not pollute, cars do. That's it, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matthew? Hi, um, well, it seems like this decision is a foregone conclusion, but I just wanna register my dissent to it. Um, so I'm an avid biker also. I, I bike regularly in Washington. Um, I don't think we should be encouraging more biking on Connecticut Avenue even with a protected lane. I think that the city has been pretty responsible so far in building its bike lanes on non-main thoroughfares. I and mean, you think about 15th, which has a bike lane, and 16th, which doesn't, they chose the street that had less traffic, and it was already one way to make it a bike lane. We could be turning Reno or Nebraska or other streets that don't have businesses or that have slower traffic, Joe Chase Parkway, into streets with bark bike lanes. I don't think that we need to be sacrificing our limited parking on Connecticut when there are alternate streets available where we could be building protected bike lanes. And ultimately I think our us bikers would be safer if we are being encouraged to take alternate streets, even compared to a slower, safer building those protected bike lanes on alternate routes. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Robin? Hi, all. Thank you. And I really appreciate you having this opportunity to have people speak. Um, I live in uh, 3G3. Um, I am a mom and a cyclist. I also own a car, uh, but cycling is my primary method of transportation for me and my family. Um, one of the things that hasn't been said here, I, I know it was alluded to before about um, people speaking on the listserv. Um, I will say that mm, like my husband, my friends and other cyclists and uh, parents um, feel threatened by people on the listserv. Um, they don't feel safe or comfortable even to speak up in off the road. So I just want to know, I just want to sort of put that out there that what it feels like to be a cyclist, to be someone who bike commutes down Connecticut Avenue. Um, it's not only, you know, frightful in that way, but to, to hear or to see what people are saying about cyclists um, doesn't make me feel any safer. So the more separation that we can get from, from people um, as a cyclist, uh, I think just makes the road safer for, for everyone. Um, and I, I think it's, I just want to voice my, you know, how vitally important I think that concept C is not just for, for cyclists, but for all users of Connecticut Avenue, um, that it, it really is such a vital connection for people in this community, uh, to other communities, um, up and down Connecticut Avenue, and people from other communities into our community. And, and in terms of being part of a, a larger DC community, um, supporting uh, more equitable access is incredibly important. So I, I want to reiterate sort of all the things that everyone else has said, but, but also just speak as a resident, as a mom, um, and somebody who, who doesn't feel comfortable right now biking in that direction, essentially with my family. Um, and I do it as a, a cyclist bike commuter, um, and as a healthcare provider. So my commute won't change because of the pandemic. So 
uh, thank you again for taking the time to, to listen. And uh, I really uh, hope that you all will vote in, in favor of uh, concept C. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Robin. Steve. He's on mute. Steve, you're muted. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. So um, I actually read uh, with chagrin Randy's write up on the reasons as to why it is that he's not going to be in support of this. And uh, I'll just make a few points about that. But before I do, I just wanted to talk about really that. You haven't heard my position, Steve, so don't prejudge things. Oh, well, you, you posted a letter. Is, it, are you, is no, that I'm not your position not. any longer? No, those are, those are my comments. Okay, well, then great. So let, let me then move on. This, is, this ANC's responsibility is really to the community. And the responsibility that you folks have expressed when it comes to the comprehensive plan, I heard debate, debate, debate about how you wanted to hear more from your residents and to make this a better place. There seems to be, at least from some of the comments that I've read, maybe your letter, Randy, that might not any longer be your position, is that you're not committed to doing that type of work when it comes to this bike lane. As it was mentioned by Michael, there's no plan yet, okay? There's a proposal to do Concept C. The hard work is to be done, and that's contained within Lisa and Michael's resolution. It's very clear what your role is to be on a going forward basis. Absolutely, it's your responsibility to work on the parking issue. There's plenty of off-street parking in Chevy Chase, D.C. You should have a task force that works on that issue, identifying that opportunity. Van Ness, uh, the ANC down in Van Ness, they did that. They committed funds to the Van Ness Main Street to actually put in signs as to where there's going to be parking. That's your guy's job is to get on that stuff and to make it work, okay? I can't understand how any ANC, we've had four deaths on D.C. streets. Well, actually, there's six because we had people killed at Haynes Point just the other day. would sit back and not accept that safety is the paramount issue here. That's it. Thank you, Steve. Cal? Hi, folks. Um, I am, uh, I grew up in Chevy Chase from the time I was 10. <laughs> and I'm uh, back here about five years ago after a 12 year hiatus in uh, the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, where I watched them implement the bicycle boulevards in Berkeley. Um, I support cycling for numerous reasons, not the least of which is environmental. Um, I will say that the Bicycle Boulevard program in Berkeley, which I believe is still in place, nearly all of the bicycle um, friendly places are on non-major streets. It, they don't put them on major commuting routes. That it seems a little um, almost like anti-car, <laughs> if it will. And I, you know, I think we're going to get this culture to move away from cars. Um, I don't think during the pandemic is the time to do it because there's fear of public transit and so forth. So um, I, I, I guess I, this is my, that's my first point. The second point is that um, I wonder how Maryland residents will be informed about this um, and encouraged to use non other, other driving options, particularly things that don't have them go down Ward 3 streets because we're going to make try to make Connecticut Avenue commuter less friendly, then they're gonna to have to go and use Georgia Avenue and, and, and other places like that. Um, so I wonder how that's gonna be done um, so we don't end up with Reno Road and, and, and when they ever open Oregon Avenue and all that stuff being crammed with traffic in Wisconsin Avenue. So, um, and the last thing is that I have very serious concerns that this is being done before the pandemic is over. This seems like the worst possible timing. We don't know what the traffic patterns are gonna be once um, things start to reopen. Uh, they could look very different six months from now with electric cars coming online. There could actually be more people driving cars than less. Um, 
So I would love to hear the commissioners say why this is being done now. And I know you're not making the decision to do it now, but I'm curious why this is being done now and why this is not being advocated to be pushed off to a year from now. That's it. Thank you, Cal. Uh, Garrett? Good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Garrett Hennigan. Um, I am wearing two hats tonight. I'm both a community organizer with the Washington Area Bicyclist Association uh, but also a product of your ANC. Um, I grew up in Commissioner Chang's uh, district where my parents still live, um, and I visit them just about every week. Um, so I grew up walking along Connecticut Avenue, as all of you uh, do every day. I grew up taking the bus up and down Connecticut Avenue, uh, spent plenty of time in a car. Um, and as I got older, I, I spent, you know, <laughs> days and days of my life navigating around Connecticut Avenue on a bike, um, trying every which way I could to not be on the street. Um, and I'll just say one bit of experience there. If you try to stitch together all of the low traffic uh, neighborhood streets around Connecticut Avenue, uh, you can get very few places, certainly not efficiently, but very few places, if at all. Um, so I wanted to, to speak to just a few points. Um, first off, uh, when we talk about protected bike lanes, often there's a, a misunderstanding of who these are for. Um, you may have a picture of, a, of an urban bicyclist in your head, um, and I want to dis disabuse you of the notion that that is who we are building these for. Um, there's a notion that if you build, not a notion, there, there's well-rounded national research that shows that when we build uh, streets and infrastructure, for, uh, that, that separate bicyclists from moving traffic and other major stressors, uh, like with protected bike lanes, that you attract a completely different type of person. Uh, 50 to 60% of people are interested in biking for more trips to the grocery store for errands, uh, for fun and to work, but they're concerned for their safety. Um, they look at a typical bike lane uh, that you may see around the ward, uh, such as on Porter Street, going up the hill, and they will say, no, thank you. That is far too unsafe and too stressful. There's no way I'll be there. You build a protected bike lane that's low stress. You start to see a very different kind of bicyclist. You start to see kids because their parents feel comfortable riding with them there. You start to see women. You start to see bike bicyclists of color, people who otherwise would not take that risk, who look nothing like me. Um, so there's a, there's a notion that we shouldn't be making this decision right now we don't know how things will come back. I want you to close your eyes for a second and imagine what if we created an environment where people at this moment made different choices and the way that we came back was not everyone hopping in a car, um, but coming back in a different way that's more sustainable and better for our community that also makes for better business and more livable streets. Um, and you wrap it I, up I wanted, Garrett. yes, I can do that. Um, so just a, a note on concept C uh, that's not about bicycling. Um, compared to option B, which is the only other option you have right now, aside from no build, concept C is the best for pedestrian safety um, because it is the only one that offers the option for including left turn lanes, median pedest uh, pedestrian refuge islands. Um, it includes a ton of traffic calming for slower speeding, uh, less speeding. Um, on it, it even makes it easier across the street. Um, I just implore you all to think about the future um, and not about the challenges of a year ago uh, as we build back, you know, something like better. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Gary. Ryan? Hi, guys. Um, I live one whole block south of your ANC, uh, and I bike rather a lot on Connecticut Avenue, but I also use um, bus service and even cars occasionally. Um, you know, just today I biked up to your ANC to uh, go shopping at Parthenon and um, Little Beast and I took the bus back. Um, I support Concept C, you know, it, it is absolutely not safe to bike on Connecticut Avenue. I do it a lot. I understand very much that I'm taking my life in my hands um, and then it could have dire consequences. Um, but it is the easiest and quickest way for me often to get between destinations that are on the avenue. And that is what I bike for. I bike to and from businesses and the metro station and, um, you know, 
friends' houses and where I live that are all located on this avenue. There are no other alternatives to Connecticut Avenue through these neighborhoods that are adequate, um, that are safe, that you know work the way we need them to. Um, I just implore you guys, please, 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 to um, you know support option C, um, make it better, you know, do the work on a block by block basis to make this safe for everyone, to make it better for pedestrians, to make it better for bus riders. You know, all of these things can be done within the framework of option C. Um, and I hope that you guys uh, support it and support bringing it all the way up to Chevy Chase Circle. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, David? Thank you for having me tonight. My name is David Christiel. I am the chair of ANC, a, excuse me, AN3F. I'm glad to be here tonight. So we passed seven to zero to zero a resolution in support of concept C, which is the protected bike lanes. And we had concerns, um, like some of the concerns that you've raised and we've seen in the chat about first about parking and then second about cut to traffic. And I'll address parking first. Like somebody mentioned earlier, we also made a grant to the Venice Main Street uh, for them to do public art, but also to help us with wayfinding. So when folks, if Concept C does go through, they can, uh, they can, we can help them find parking. Uh, DDOT's also willing to work with us uh, as we explore parking options in this interim period. And I think we're confident that between these two sources that I think we're gonna have a pretty good solution to the parking, particularly in the commercial areas, which I know up in Chevy Chase is an issue for you as well. Um, the same thing with traffic diversions. I think we're confident that um, if we get concept C, that we'll be able to work with DDOT uh, in the coming months and hopefully years as C is implemented to mitigate the traffic that's gonna go elsewhere. But we mainly did it for safety and it was the right thing to do. Um, I'm a cyclist and I'm a father. Uh, I have a son who wasn't in DC when he got hit by a car, but he was in Philly. And he hasn't been, he hasn't been on a bike uh, riding on the streets since then. So I, I, I can understand Commissioner Gore's experience. And I think a lot of us have, if not ourselves, we certainly have people that we knew that have either been hit by a bike and what the consequences of that are. Um, I attended the ghost ride last week uh, down Mass Avenue. And I think part of this, you know, we don't wanna do this on Connecticut Avenue. And so concept C hopefully will prevent that from happening. Another point that was made earlier about, and this is why I'm here, um, you know, we're neighbors. We're a sandwich between 3-4-G three, four, three, four, um, and 3-C, and so we want to we be good neighbors. And so 3-C uh, passed their resolution, uh, I think it was on a Monday night. We passed ours on a Tuesday night, and we're so, certainly here in support of you all to pass uh, the concept C tonight. So thanks for having us, and look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Uh, yes. Jeff, Jeff. Je you're, you're, um. Yes, I'm on mute, I'm on top. Yes. Um, I have a business here on Connecticut Avenue. I also, it's a medical business and uh, I, I tend to agree with, with some of the anecdotal uh, conversation. There's probably a lot more, uh, bike accidents than are reported, uh, basically fender benders. I, I see a few of these people in my clinic. And so I think safety is by far the most important issue here. And one thing that we're not gonna be able to change is the, the bicycling has become mainstream again. It's really hit the United States it's like a flood. My daughter, everybody I know is doing it now in some way, shape or form, and everybody's excited to get into it. One, it's easy on the body. So we have to make it safe for these people. And uh, Plan C is just, it's amazing. It's just a concept right now, though, that this is, we don't need to delay this a year. We need to, it's not going to be a year till it's done if we don't get started on it right now. I think we have a lot of really good people on this right now, and that's something that's not being considered. I mean, just phenomenal people are participating in making this work. Now is the time to make it happen. And I think making it done, making it happen safely 
is one of the most important things we can do. May I ask, Randy, may I just ask Jeff a question since he's our only um, panelist uh, who owns a business on Connecticut Avenue. He, his clinic is above the Starbucks in that, in that stretch of street where there is no um, back lot parking. So Dr. Hackless, have you, have you th thought through this in terms of impact on your business? Do you think it'll be a net plus, a net negative, a net neutral? It's, it's very interesting. Um, we uh, discourage people from parking on Connecticut Avenue because it, they have meters there. So everybody we have parks off Connecticut anyway, and it's not a problem at all. The most people have to walk is a quarter to a half a block. And I, I think it's much safer for, for them to park there anyway. It, it, uh, not only that, I'm getting so many people riding their bikes to my business now. Um, it's, you know, it's easy to see it, it, if you kind of think in, in an antique kind of way how, it, you know, oh, we can't change anything about parking. You know, there's sometimes you think about, I guess the only concept I would think about is drop on, uh, drop off and pick up people that have a, a little bit of trouble ambulating. Um, this might be for restaurants and it might be for my business. If, you know, we actually, we go the extra mile and go see people if they can't make it. I know businesses can deliver food. Not everybody is gonna make it out there. And, and I'm sorry for that, but we go the extra mile to see people in their homes if they can't make it to see us. And I think restaurants can deliver food too. So, you know, yes, I've thought about it. I think that's such a minority problem. I think by far it will help my business. Uh, it will bring more people out on the sidewalk. I'll get more visibility. Um, it will help. I hope it'll bring more restaurants here. It will be, it, you know, what's good for other businesses or good for my businesses. It's visibility. Uh, we're all in this together. And overall, I think it's going to be a significant plus for all of us. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hennigan. You're muted. Okay, you I think you can hear me now. Yes, we can. Uh, my name is John Hennigan. I live on Nevada Avenue, uh, right at Chevy Chase Circle. And I basically this evening just wanted to uh, ask you to fully support resolution concept C with protected bike lanes for Connecticut Avenue. Um, I guess all I really want to say is uh, I've been biking all my life and, and uh, a moment ago you, you heard my son talking about biking in this area. So I'm a little bit older than he is and I like to bike, but I'm terrified of Connecticut Avenue. And the only way I've ever done that is with him in one of the uh, bike to work rides a couple years ago. And it's still terrifying. <laughs> Even with a slug of people going down the street, you're still competing with traffic that does not care, even, even if there's lots of people. So I, I've been in favor of say I am in favor of safety and, and want to emphasize that I think this is a sensible thing to do for now and the future and the people that will be riding and biking in the future. Not me, but people like our children and our children's children and yours too. This is a this is a future issue. This is a honestly, it's a young people issue. So we need to change. Change is important. I so fully support this and hope you do too. Thank you. Okay. Do we have one more, Lisa? Is that right? Yep. Tom? Uh, Pat, hello, am I muted? No, we can hear oh, you. Uh, okay, uh, all this time and I still don't know how to use this app. Um, so uh, my name is Tom. I am a resident down in Cleveland Park and I just wanted to um, speak up this evening to implore um, you all to support option C. Um, if you are you know, at all serious about the threat of climate change, then really, um, you know, uh, that is the only option. Um, you know, we look at cities around the world um, that have made a lot of changes uh, to their streets 
in recent years to um, encourage, you know, walking and biking and discourage the use of automobiles in our cities. And in almost every place, um, those changes have been, uh, you know, widely supported. And if DC wants to, you know, keep its status as a world city, we should be doing these sorts of things that encourage our neighborhoods rather than uh, suburban commuters, which I think that, you know, our planning system has for a very long time prioritized. You know, we have a, you know, what is functionally a highway through our community. And, um, you know, we can change that, um, you know, it, and a lot of the time the traffic will, you know, uh, to a certain degree evaporate. We see that, um, you know, in San Francisco, they took down the Embarcadero Freeway. And a lot of those people just stopped driving to work. They decided to take transit or move somewhere that was, you know, walkable to their job or, you know, a variety of other more sustainable choices. And at the moment, we have a status quo that is, you know, dangerous to our community, bad for our air, and, um, you know, just generally unsafe. And option C, you know, retains uh, a very wide road, but it dedicates some more of that space to people in sustainable means of transportation. And I hope you'll support that. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Okay. I think that was everyone that uh, wanted to speak. Um, Connie, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. So are we going to um, say what we think about the resolution now? Are we ready to do that? Well, I don't know whether or you actually formally moved the resolution and got no, a second. I don't think we did. I don't think so either, right. So I moved the um, adoption of our resolution support and concept C. Is there a second? Okay. Connie, you want to? Yes, um, I, I, I just wanted to, um, to say that I spent a lot of time uh, considering, you know, the resolution and um, uh, Randy's comments and other people's comments, you know, on the commission and so forth, as well as all of the DDOT, you know, studies that existing condition study and presentations. And, you know, even before doing that, I felt pretty strongly that we need to have protected bike lanes. Um, and let me just share some of my thinking, which I shared with the commissioners. Um, you know, for me, the most important consideration in support of Concept C is equity for bicyclists. You know, as a matter of public policy, uh, we should make this important corridor bicycle friendly because it's less polluting, it's better for health and it's time. Uh, but whether or not we retain or stop reversible lane operations, roadway use should be equitable across the four main categories of users. So vehicular, you know, people who drive vehicles, transit, cyclists, and pedestrians. Right now, pedestrians and cyclists are the most vulnerable. You know, I have known people just crossing from, on, uh, from uh, one side of Connecticut on the west side on legation to the east side and almost being hit by cars. My family, my friends, my friend's son got hit. Um, and I certainly am a terrible cyclist, but I think that I would cycle more if I felt more protected. Um, I, I believe that um, designated bike lanes protect not only the cyclists, but also the drivers and the pedestrians because you have designated lanes and then you don't have to worry about someone coming into your lane. Um, to me, uh, this is the starting point, you know, and, um, and cyclists should be afforded the protection they need and, and pedestrians should have right away and who have right away should be able to cross these intersections safely. And I think concept C does that. It, it, it targets both of these uh, populations. Um, I also think that, um, uh, that uh, if more people bike to work, shop, play, because it's safer with protected bike lanes. And if it's true, as some have argued that with de designated lanes for cars and for bikes, um, this allows traffic to flow, not more slowly, but more efficiently, then I think we should aim to make this possible. And really, I think this year for all of us has just been such a crazy year. And um, I don't think data from before the like old normal is going to be the new normal. 
you know, just yesterday I was walking around, there were so many people out on bikes. It, like it brought a smile to my face because I feel like they're a family, they're traveling together, they're getting exercise, but I was definitely concerned about the ability to go from A to B safely. And I think um, Lisa's story, certainly, you know, it, it's the story that, that she's experienced, um, but I've, I, I know other people like my husband who's written on his bike and a door opens and he's gone over and a lot of people have been hurt. So I think we need to do it. I think that, um, that with COVID, uh, we don't know what the flow of tra traffic will be. We don't know the volume of diverted traffic. We don't know, um, we can't predict even bicycle, bicycle usage really, because none of this is gonna be like before. Uh, this is a whole new world. And uh, companies I know nowadays are not even going to return, you know, to what was before, which was hardly any telecommuting. I think we've all proven that we are all working from home, long hours, and we don't need to necessarily be there. And companies are going to start to save money by not. And that's a whole nother, you know, economic uh, issue. So I'm in full support. And I do think, though, with um, people raising you know, the parking task force that Jerry Malice, who was the former commissioner in my district, um, I think we should continue that task force. I think we should look at um, technology, uh, sensors, you know, the ability to find spaces fast to help people look for spaces around. I think we need to work with DDOT to see their own study on parking um, and uh, to figure that out and to work together so that anything that is a what economists call a negative spillover can be mitigated and contained. So thank you so much. I do think this is a, a, a time for us as a community to put a vision forward, a future vision forward and to make that happen. And I would love to see it uh, for my family and for my friends who are strong bikers. Thank you. Chris? Yeah, I just wanna say, I, you know, I in the past I've been a little lukewarm on Concept C, but it's obvious to me that uh, this is something that everybody wants. Uh, I mean, I've heard from people, you know, in all the, all the up and down Connecticut Avenue. And, uh, you know, I think we ought to try it. Uh, you know, I'm a bike rider. I've ridden down Connecticut Avenue. It's pretty scary, especially in non rush hour. You know, somebody can open their park, their car door in front of you. So you got to watch both sides. It's, it's, it's pretty uh, unnerving. So I, I think we just, you know, we ought to go with, let's try it. And, and uh, you know, I'm a little nervous about the traffic. Uh, you know, we, we had a disaster. Everybody remembers Military Road. I don't know, it was 15 years ago and they tried to make it a two lane road from four lanes and what a mess that was. But, you know, maybe uh, maybe Connie's right. Uh, you know, maybe people uh, will, will be going to work maybe two days a week or three days a week downtown instead of five days. So it, it may not be a big problem. I mean, right now, Connecticut Avenue is only two lanes each way. and I haven't seen much, you know, there haven't been a lot of problems. Admittedly, a lot of people aren't going to work downtown, but, you know, that meant it, it's possible downtown may have to rethink itself. So uh, I'm, I'm willing to try it. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's basically what I have to say. John? John? Well, I, I guess I might be the low dissenter here or not. Um, I have a couple of problems with the proposal as a proposal within the commission. And I have a, a few problems with concept C as well. I think our, our resolution as written has quite a few caveats in there as, as Michael pointed out. So I'm not so sure we are actually conveying support of the support of the concept through that. I would prefer to withdraw that and have a, a, a proposal in which maybe concept C is sort of a starting point for discussion. Uh, I, could, I could see that. I think it's probably the best of the, of the options for a starting point for discussion in the future. And then perhaps whatever, whatever our feelings are in a, in a, in a formal comment to, to DDA to compose them rather than use the resol a, a, what I think is sort of a flawed resolution. Uh, uh, sent to, sent to data. I think we could probably do that within the time frame. Maybe we have a little more time than we thought we had. I don't know, but I would rather have a coherent letter to DDA with whatever recommendations or, or observations we have. As to the situation with with the bike lanes, um, I was 
concerned about the proposal for that when you look at the EDOT website and it shows those little sticks coming up, I don't think they protect anybody. Um, I think a 2,800 pound car at 25 miles an hour is gonna mash through those and I'm not so sure that protects it very well. I was encouraged that, um, I guess, I guess uh, Michael said that there was a, uh, they would do those until they poured some cement. So if there's a physical barrier that changes things a little bit. Nonetheless, uh, the major point I have is the, is the traffic diversion from all of this through the other streets. And if the data we have is the data we're going with, uh, number five in our proposal mentions that Wisconsin Avenue and Connecticut Avenue are in vision, whatever the vision is, the mayor's vision, are two of the most dangerous streets in the city. So if we divert traffic from Connecticut to Wisconsin, even a modest increase as the, as the proposal says, I think that makes Wisconsin even, even more dangerous. I also think the adjacent neighborhoods will become more dangerous. So I was taken with the comment, the, the two comments that were made, which favor my point of view. One was by the uh, Mr. Simone who mentioned uh, using uh, Nebraska or using other other less traveled lanes as the places to experiment with or or put in some some designated lanes, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, you wouldn't get that much traffic diversion. They would be inherently uh, uh, inherently safer. Uh, and also the person who mentioned what they did in Berkeley, which was again the the um, bicycle lanes uh, that they that they put in there were not on their main main streets, they, they put them on the, on the less traveled streets. So I think that's, uh, that also conveys the, the problem of, of, uh, of diversion. So I would have to, at this point, if we, if we continue with this, this resolution, just for the internals of the resolution and some of the problems, I guess I would have to vote, uh, vote no on this. Peter? Peter? Well, uh, in this situation, I'd like to hear from the two commissioners. We've heard from one of the two commissioners who are on the advisory um, panel, you and uh, uh, Chris. And uh, we've heard from Chris. I'd like to hear your views because as I've told the authors of this resolution, uh, I've been on this commission for 16 weeks. I realized that this was actually something that was gonna come forward maybe last Thursday, I'd understood until we started this meeting that we, I could have a few days to study it because we could comment until the end of May. Um, so I'm left having to make a decision with essentially no information from but one DDOT presentation in January. So Randy, what are your views on this subject? Uh, I, did, Lisa, did you wanna to respond to John and okay, why, why don't you go ahead first? Then I'll. I'll well, can I'll, we, I'll, actually, can we do it in the opposite order, Randy? Can we? Can we before we respond to a no vote? Can we? Can we hear your vote, please? Sure. I, well, you know, I'm really torn on this. My aspirations are to do exactly what uh, a lot of people have suggested here: create safety for bikes, bicyclists on Connecticut Avenue. That's my aspiration. And I agree with all of the rationale for doing that. Uh, I think DDOT let us down in this instance though. And that uh, even at this stage, I mean, we are granted there's more to come, but even at this stage, I think DDOT has not done a good job of identifying uh, the consequences that could flow from this. Uh, I will vote for this. Uh, amendment uh, for, for this resolution, but I will still submit my comments to DDOT because I believe that DDOT has a lot of work to do and they've only begun. They, they, they haven't even begun to, begun to scratch the surface as far as I'm concerned. And if they are going to really truly care about safety and really truly care about um, multimodal transportation, they have a lot more work to do. They have not done anything, to my mind, I, I haven't seen a single thing looking at the impact on the buses on Connecticut Avenue, for instance, not a single thing. 
I think they also need to be looking at the connections between the bike path on Connecticut Avenue and wherever people are coming from or going to. They're not going to, these are not going to be entirely people living on Connecticut Avenue. One of the criticisms about bike paths in the district has always been that they are not connected to each other and that there's no overall plan for how bicyclists can get from one place to another. What this is going to do is it leaves you, it leaves the bicyclists, now 10 times more bicyclists going down Connecticut Avenue than now, it leaves them at Calvert Street with no place to go. There's not a con continuation of the bike path at that point. I think DDOT has an obligation to say, okay, what's going to happen? How, how are we going to get people from there to downtown or wherever they want to go? The, their destination is not Calvert Street. So I think there is a lot more work to be done. And DDOT has not even begun to talk with any of the people, the businesses along Connecticut Avenue in our business district, if they are planning to extend the bike path all the way to Chevy Chase Circle. And, and it may make sense to do that, but they need to do that outreach and they haven't done it at all. So far as I can tell, no one has been contacted. No, no DDOT has not contact, contacted any of the businesses on Connecticut Avenue. So I will vote for this as an aspiration, but I, I am really disappointed that Chris and I have been working with DDOT for a long time on this and longer than anybody else uh, in this commission. And I have consistently asked them for more, asked them for more, asked them for more, and I don't get anything. And it's really been frustrating. So I am not confident that DDOT will address these issues as they, as they think they should. Uh, there are going to be other issues that arise from this. Uh, it it can't, can't be otherwise. There will be things, consequences from this. And I'm not convinced that DDOT has thought those through or that it, it is prepared to mitigate those in advance so that we understand what the problems are going to be and that we've addressed them in advance. So again, I, I'm not absolutely convinced with everything that's in that resolution. I will nevertheless support it. And I will submit my comments uh, as an individual commissioner uh, separately to DDOT. Now, Peter, you want to speak or Chris or Lisa? Peter? Sure, I'd be happy to speak. So isn't this an interesting situation? Um, the, I've been on this commission for 16 weeks. This issue has been going on for two years. The two commissioners who are most knowledgeable about it are gonna vote for this. I wanna say a few things about this. Uh, the reason I ran for the ANC is because I live at the corner of Military Road and Chevy Chase Parkway. It's an extraordinarily dangerous intersection. When my late wife and I bought the house, she made me come down twice from New York and stand there and count traffic. And when we first moved in, she had me hire a, bring in a contractor. She was planning to build a kind of marginal line between uh, the house and uh, the intersection so cars wouldn't smack into our fence, come through into the yard and kill our children. Um, in the years I've lived here, there have been accidents on the average of 12 to 20 a year. Most of those accidents, almost to the point of all of them, have the following format. A car going one way or the other on military and the classic cut through street that we're talking about taking more traffic now, Chevy Chase Parkway, cars coming out Chevy Chase Parkway and broadsiding the cars in the intersection or the reverse, cars coming out of Chevy Chase Parkway and getting broadsided. We've tried for years to get some safety measures put in. In fact, on Chevy Chase Parkway further up, there are already speed humps. Part of doing that was getting a traffic assessment. The assessment showed that more than half of the traffic on Chevy Chase Parkway during rush hours Maryland license plate. So it's already being used as a cut through. And it's going to be used more heavily if we 
narrow the, make more of a bottleneck out of Connecticut. And all I would say to this is that, I mean, my conclusion about this is that public safety is not, a, is not just on one side here. Public safety is for the children who live across the street from me on both sides, right? Those children are threatened by fast moving cars that are commuting. Um, and so it is not clear to me where the balance is struck. I told the authors of this uh, 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 resolution that I needed a little time. Uh, and I feel like I still need time. I will say this, that it is clear to me as a bicyclist and as somebody who's lived in America for a long time that the city and the society should create a durable bike infrastructure. And I remember back the implementation of one of our other infrastructure changes, uh, the American with Disabilities Act. And it took, a, it took 30 years to get real infrastructure in place. And we did it slowly. And we did jury rig things to get the thing, first steps taken. Uh, and maybe, um, maybe concept C is the jury rig thing we need. But I have, not in my, I have not had time in my 16 weeks to look at, at this. And in any case, given what Michael has said about how many aspects of this decision turn out already to have been made. You know, Council Member Che says it's already decided that reversible lanes are, uh, are, 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 are gonna be wiped out. Uh, DDA has already said they're not gonna do any more uh, data. Uh, and many people, um, Randy, you and uh, uh, Chris and, and others of you have said that this issue is only at the concept stages. So I would say to the bicyclists uh, who have advocated for this on the line, I may well come with you, but I'm going to study it first. So I will abstain. Lisa? Um, I would just say at this point that um, I think our resolution has a lot in it that where we point out issues with DDOT. Randy, you could, you know, even include some of your points in ours. Um, you know, I wouldn't object to that, but I think we do need to move forward on concept C. I think we need to work hard as a commission to ensure and hold DDOT accountable and to, um, you know, keep making progress. So we have to address the traffic calming. You know, we have different points that we could do that. We can, in, um, you know, include some further discussions with DDOT and just continue to hold them accountable, but we can't let them and their inaction um, and our hesitation, you know, continue to impose safety risk for the public. We have people on our streets dying every day. So I would call for the vote. Okay. Um, hey, can I just say one thing, Randy, which is technically, I Technically, she's called for the vote, so we can't have any more discussion. But go ahead, go ahead. I'll let you. I'll let you. No, I just wanted Not to say that, with respect to what you said, that we are building for the future, that we are essentially fiduciaries for for the future. That I see uh, you and me and everybody else in this commission fully understanding the 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 weight of the responsibility that we have in this regard, because this Concept C um, safety proposition and the small area plan um, are mirror images of one another. And we have a lot of work to do as a commission, hopefully with the, with the community's um, support to, to live up to the aspirations that you articulate. Mm -hmm. So I just believe that you're, you're right uh, this is uh, an aspiration. This is our fiduciary responsibility to, to future generations. And we are up to the hard part now, which is the, the granular work to get it done in the most effective way possible. And I commit myself to doing that as you have Randy on the SAP and all other things that we've done collectively as mm -hmm. a, as a, a council. And I would just say to, to Peter, uh, this will give us greater ammunition to insist that there be stop signs on Military Road at Chevy Chase yep. Park. I mean, I just can't see how they could deny that at this point. But 
or, or in the last three years. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> been, we have suggested that for three years. And so you're right. But and I have, as I've said before, I have very little confidence in DDOT uh, to do the right thing. But we're going to have to uh, insist on that and um, continue to pound them on it. Um, because again, I, I, I do not think DDOT has done a good job on this. And um, so we'll, we'll take a vote. Is it illegal to put up a private stop sign? <laughs> yes. Are you thinking about getting into business, Michael? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, people have painted, they have painted, you know, lines on the street. So you could certainly do it in the dead of night, I suppose. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, Lisa's like, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that, don't do that. So are we calling? Okay. Yes, we're calling. Okay. Um, all those in favor of the motion? That's, I can't see Peter. Peter's, okay. I know, because there's chats five. coming up. Peter's five. abstaining. Mm -hmm. And all those who oppose? One, and abstentions? One, okay, five, one, and one. All right, thank you all. Thank you all for the participants uh, who um, chimed in tonight. We appreciate it. Um, and we'll move on now to our commission business. Uh, if there's nothing else on that, that topic. Um, with regard to the minutes for the April 12th meeting, uh, Lisa, have you circulated those? I didn't think so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, we'll wait until I'm the whispering. I will get them this week. I pro it's been crazy. I, I have Sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, any checks done? I don't think there are any, are there? No, but as long as we're on finance, I, there was a question this afternoon. I sent around a memo to everybody. I also included a, a, a copy of the current quarterly report. And we could, uh, as I said, the numbers on that are correct. We have a couple of outstanding invoices we have to chase down before we send the package down to Dawn. But I think uh, I would I would move that that report be um, approved by the commission. Is there a second? I'll second. <laughs> All those in favor of adopting the quarterly report? Six. Uh, all those opposed? Oh, seven. Okay. <laughs> thought you were going. Thought you were going to oppose. No, no, no. Uh, I just have this hand brace, so it's. Uh, uh, okay. All right. All right. Thank you, John. Um, all right then. Uh, possible items for our May tenth meeting. Um, we will have a report on a small area plan process, as we always do. We'll have a report on the racial and social equity committee. Uh, Lisa and I are co-chairing. Um, I have arranged for a presentation um, from the Department of Parks and Recreation and a discussion with them about the new arrangements for programming and also uh, mm. when the various DPR facilities will reopen, including our community center. Um, and that's all I have for the moment. Uh, I'm sure other things will arise. Anything, anybody else have other things? Connie? We may have a grant application from okay. Chevy Chase Main Street, but I'm going to check with Alex. I think you could put it on and then I'll double check again because he's had some okay. conversation. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other comments? I have a, I have a question. Peter? Peter? Um, uh, I, I, as we said, it's hard to remember back to that part of the meeting, but as we said, this the challenge of of, of, of executing these big meetings uh, is tremendous. Um, it, it would make our task a lot easier if it turns out jo uh, uh, jo Josh Lasky, the facilitator uh, uh, that uh, OP hired, that if we could interview him and decide whether he could be a, an independent neutral uh, facilitator. Um, um, I, I really hope that uh, commissioners can find time. I hope that OP agrees and Josh Lasky agrees and that we can do this meeting this week. Uh, one thing I didn't do and I won't trouble us now with doing is uh, I have had conversations with the people at Work Tank in Seattle who are virtual meeting specialists um, and uh, we are having another conversation Thursday um, and they're reviewing tape of the 
to a kickoff meeting and uh, and some of our meetings so they get a feel for what we're about uh, and we're going to work together on that. But I, I we're going to have to, as you said, Randy, uh, you know, we're going to have to move this along and having if, if Lasky would could work, if it, it would be great. It would take one piece of the puzzle, one one piece of load off our shoulders. So, um, well, OP, OP has agreed to uh, set up a meeting with him uh, for all the commissioners or as many commissioners as can attend. It's just a matter of time finding a time for it, and I I think we're uh, having a hard time doing that. But uh, we'll, I'll see if we can. Did fix somebody it. did somebody send around a doodle poll? I haven't done that. No. I, I, I did. I did. I did. I sent out did. a doodle poll. I did. Well, I yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But um, I think when that. Send, uh, when did you send it? When did you send it? I sent it. I sent it this afternoon when we had the series of conversations. And I said Thursday seemed right. But then I think Michael said he couldn't do Someone said he couldn't do I it. Can't, I think it was Michael. Uh, yeah. Michael do couldn't Thursday. do it. I'm but out I of have town. the poll. Okay, but I have the poll and Peter can't do Friday. So I was like, if we're gonna do it this week, Lisa was busy tomorrow, it's Tuesday, and then Wednesday was hard for someone else. So I said Thursday. So if we wanna do it this week, let's aim for Thursday. If we don't okay. wanna do it this week, then we gotta do it after Peter gets back, like Wednesday of next week. We have no assurance that, that Lasky is gonna be available. Right. Then. Okay, so. I, I wanna offer a time. Yeah, hold it. Lasky, I mean, it really needs to be available. I mean, my God. It, it, oh, yeah, Peter, it, it, on two days' notice, you can't say drop whatever else you've got planned. And oh, I see. I see. I thought you meant about next week if we can't do no, this. No, no, oh, no. Yeah. Two days' notice. Just fill out the poll. Fill the poll out. It's an exo yondo poll. And okay, no. uh, fill I'll, it out. I'll click it. Yep. I, I don't remember seeing it, but I'll look. Yeah, for it. I sent it. I did. I promise. Okay. Okay. And if, yeah. if Thursday is the best for everybody, then just go ahead and one of someone will fill me we'll, in. We'll okay. fill you in. Yeah. Right. Okay. There are, I think, uh, about 577 chat entries. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and Bill, can you can you read them out loud now, Randy? Please. I, I'd be glad to. I'd be glad to. We have to uh, make sure. <laughs> so uh, I will give uh, Stephanie a little bit of time to make sure we've recorded all of that. Uh, and uh, so thank everyone for attending and we're adjourned for the evening. Thank, thank you guys. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah, yeah. 46. Okay. Are we done? <laughs> yeah, we're done.